Chapter 21 of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mother Jane. Well, well, what did Trome want here this morning? cried a harsh voice from amid the tangled walks behind me. Seems to me he finds this place pretty interesting all of a sudden. I turned upon the intruder with a look that should have daunted him. I had recognised William's courteous tones, and was in no mood to endure a questioning so unbecoming in one of his age to one of mine. But as I met his eye, which had something in it besides anger and suspicion, something that was quizzical if not impertinent, I changed my intention, and bestowed upon him a conciliatory smile which I hope escaped the eye of the good angel who records against man all his small hypocrisies and petty deceits. Mr. Trome rides for his health, said I. Seeing me looking up the road at Mother Jane, he stopped to tell me some of the idiosyncrasies of that old woman. A very harmless courtesy, Mr. Knollys. Very, he echoed, not without a touch of sarcasm. I only hope that is all, he muttered, with a sidelong look back at the house. Lucetta hasn't a particle of belief in that man's friendship. Or, rather, she believes he never goes anywhere without a particular intention. And I do believe she's right. Or why should he come spying around here just at a time when... He caught himself up with almost a look of terror. When... when you are here, he completed lamely. I do not think, I retorted, more angrily than the occasion perhaps warranted, that the word spying applies to Mr. Trome, but if it does, what has he to gain from a pause at the gate and a word to such a new acquaintance as I am? I don't know, William persisted suspiciously. Trome's a sharp fellow. If there was anything to see, he would see it without half looking. But there isn't. You don't know of anything wrong here, do you, which such a man as that, hand in glove with the police as we know him to be, might consider himself interested in? Astonished both at this blundering committal of himself and at the certain sort of anxious confidence he showed in me, I hesitated for a moment, but only for a moment, since if half my suspicions were true, this man must not know that my perspicacity was more to be feared than even Mr. Trome's was. If Mr. Trome shows an increased interest in this household during the last two days, said I, with a heroic defiance of ridicule, which I hope Mr. Grice has duly appreciated, I beg leave to call your attention to the fact that on yesterday morning he came to deliver a letter addressed to me, which had inadvertently been left at his house, and that this morning he called to inquire how I had spent the night, which, in consideration of the ghosts which are said to haunt this house, and the strange and uncanny apparitions which only three nights ago made the entrance to this lane hideous to one pair of eyes at least, should not cause a gentleman's son like yourself any astonishment. It does not seem odd to me, I assure you. He laughed. I meant he should, and, losing almost instantly his air of doubt and suspicion, turned toward the gate from which I had just moved away, muttering, Well, it's a small matter to me anyway. It's only the girls that are afraid of Mr. Trome. I am not afraid of anything but losing Saracen, who has pined like the deuce at his long confinement in the court. Hear him now. Just hear him and I could hear the low and unhappy moaning of the hound distinctly. It was not a pleasant sound, and I was almost tempted to bid William unloose the dog, but thought better of it. By the way, said he, speaking of Mother Jane, I have a message to her from the girls. You will excuse me if I speak to the poor woman. Alarmed by his politeness more than I ever have been by his roughness and inconsiderate sarcasms, I surveyed him inquiringly as he left the gate, and did not know whether to stand my ground or retreat to the house. I decided to stand my ground, 
a message to this woman seeming to me a matter of some interest i was glad i did for after some five minutes absence during which he had followed her into the house i saw him come back again in a state of sullen displeasure which however partially disappeared when he saw me still standing by the gate ah miss butterworth you can do me a favour the old creature is in one of her stubborn fits to-day and won't give me a hearing she may not be so deaf to you she isn't apt to be to women will you cross the road and speak to her i will go with you you needn't be afraid the way he said this the confidence he expected to inspire had almost a ghastly effect upon me did he know or suspect that the only thing i feared in this lane was he evidently not for he met my eye quite confidently it would not do to shake his faith at such a moment as this so calling upon providence to see me safely through this adventure i stepped into the highway and went with him into mother jane's cottage had i been favoured with any other companion than himself i should have been glad of this opportunity as it was i found myself ignoring any possible danger i might be running in my interest in the remarkable interior to which i was thus introduced having been told that mother jane was poor i had expected to confront squalor and possibly filth but i never have entered a cleaner place or one in which order made the poorest belongings look more decent the four walls were unfinished and so were the rafters which formed the ceiling but the floor neatly laid in brick was spotless and the fireplace also of brick was as deftly swept as one could expect from the little scrub i saw hanging by its side crouched within this fireplace sat the old woman we had come to interview her back was to us and she looked helplessly and hopelessly deaf ask her said william pointing towards her with a rude gesture if she will come to the house at sunset my sisters have some work for her to do they will pay her well advancing at his bidding i passed a rocking chair in the cushion of which a dozen patches met my eye this drew my eyes toward a bed over which a counterpane was drawn made up of a thousand or more pieces of coloured calico and noticing their varied shapes and the intricacy with which they were put together i wondered whether she ever counted them the next moment i was at her back seventy burst from her lips as i leaned over her shoulder and showed her the coin which i had taken pains to have in my hand yours i announced pointing in the direction of the house if you will do some work for miss knollys to-night slowly she shook her head before burying it deeper in the shawl she wore wrapped about her shoulders listening a minute i thought i heard her mutter twenty-eight ten but no more i can count no more go away but i'm nothing if not persistent feeling for her hands which were hidden away somewhere under her shawl i touched them with the coin and cried again this and more for a small piece of work to-night come you are strong earn it what kind of work is it i asked innocently or it must have appeared innocently of mr knollys who was standing at my back he frowned all the black devils in his heart coming into his look at once how do i know ask loreen she's the one who sent me i don't take account of what goes on in the kitchen i begged his pardon somewhat sarcastically i own and made another attempt to attract the attention of the old crone who had remained perfectly callous to my allurements i thought you liked money i said for lizzie you know for lizzie but she only muttered in lower and lower gutturals i can count no more and disgusted at my failure being one who accounts failure as little short of disgrace i drew back and made my way toward the door saying 
she's in a different mood from what she was yesterday when she snatched a quarter from me at the first intimation it was hers i don't think you can get her to do any work to-night innocents take these freaks isn't there someone else you can call in the scowl that disfigured his none too handsome features was a fitting prelude to his words you talk said he as if we had the whole village at our command how did you succeed with the locksmith yesterday came didn't he well that's what we have to expect whenever we want any help whirling on his heel he led the way out of the hut whither i would have immediately followed him if i had not stopped to take another look at the room which struck me even upon a second scrutiny as one of the best ordered and best kept i had ever entered even the strings and strings of dried fruits and vegetables which hung in festoons from every beam of the roof were free from dust and cobwebs and though the dishes were few and the pans scarce they were bright and speckless giving to the shelf along which they were ranged a semblance of ornament wise enough to keep her house in order thought i and actually found it hard to leave so attractive to my eyes are absolute neatness and order william was pushing at his own gate when i joined him he looked as if he wished i had spent the morning with mother jane and was barely civil in our walk up to the house i was not therefore surprised when he burst into a volley of oaths at the doorway and turned upon me almost as if he would forbid me the house for tap 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 from some distant quarter came a distinct sound like that of nails being driven into a plank end of chapter 21chapter 22 of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain the third night mother jane must have changed her mind after we left her for late in the evening i caught a glimpse of her burly figure in the kitchen as i went to give hannah some instructions concerning certain little changes in the housekeeping arrangements which the girls and i had agreed were necessary to our mutual comfort i wished to address the old crone but warned by the ill-concealed defiance with which hannah met my advances that any such attempt on my part would be met by anything but her accustomed good nature i refrained from showing my interest in her strange visitor or from even appearing conscious of her own secret anxieties and evident preoccupation loreen and lucetta exchanged a meaning look as i rejoined them in the sitting-room but my volubility in regard to the domestic affair which had just taken me to the kitchen seemed to speedily reassure them and when a few minutes later i said good night and prepared to leave the room it was with the conviction that i had relieved their mind at the expense of my own mother jane in the kitchen at this late hour meant business what that business was i seemed to know only too well i had formed a plan for the night which required some courage recalling lucetta's expression of the morning that i might expect a repetition of the former night's experiences i prepared to profit by the warning in a way she little meant satisfied that if there was any truth in the suspicions i had formed there would be an act performed in this house to-night which if seen by me would forever settle the question agitating the whole countryside i made up my mind that no locked door should interfere with my opportunity of doing so how i effected this result i will presently relate lucetta had accompanied me to my door with a lighted candle i hear you had some trouble with matches last night said she you will find them all right now hannah must be blamed for some of this carelessness then as i began some reassuring reply she turned upon me with a look that was almost fond and throwing out her arms cried entreatingly 
won't you give me a little kiss miss butterworth we have not given you the best of welcomes but you are my mother's old friend and sometimes i feel a little lonely i could easily believe that and yet i found it hard to embrace her too many shadows swam between althea's children and myself she saw my hesitancy a hesitancy i could not but have shown even at the risk of losing her confidence and paling slightly dropped her hands with a pitiful smile you don't like me she said i do not wonder but i was in hopes you would for my mother's sake i have no claims myself you are an interesting girl and you have what your mother had not a serious side to your nature that is anything but displeasing to me but my kisses lucetta are as rare as my tears i had rather give you good advice and that is a fact perhaps it is as strong a proof of affection as any ordinary caress would be perhaps she assented but she did not encourage me to give it to her notwithstanding instead of that she drew back and bade me a gentle good-night which for some reason made me sadder than i wished to be at a crisis demanding so much nerve then she walked quickly away and i was left to face the night alone knowing that i should be rather weakened than helped by the omission of any of the little acts of preparation with which i am accustomed to calm my spirits for the night i went through them all with just as much precision as if i had expected to spend the ensuing hours in rest when all was done and only my cup of tea remained to be quaffed i had a little struggle with myself which ended in my not drinking it at all nothing not even this comfortable solace for an unsatisfactory day should stand in the way of my being the complete mistress of my wits this night had i known that this tea contained a soporific in the shape of a little harmless morphine i would have found this act of self-denial much easier it was now eleven confident that nothing would be done while my light was burning i blew it out and taking a candle and some matches in my hand softly opened my door and after a moment of intense listening stepped out and closed it carefully behind me nothing could be stiller than the house or darker than the corridor am i watched or am i not watched i queried and for an instant stood undecided then seeing nothing and hearing nothing i slipped down the hall to the door beyond mine and opening it with all the care possible stepped inside i knew the room i had taken especial note of it in my visit of the morning i knew that it was nearly empty and that there was a key in the lock which i could turn i therefore felt more or less safe in it especially as its window was undarkened by the branches that hung so thickly across my own casement shutting me in or seeming to shut me in from all communication with the outside world and the unknown guardian which i had been assured constantly attended my summons that i might strengthen my spirits by one glimpse of this same outside world before settling down for the watch i had set for myself i stepped softly to the window and took one lingering look without a belt of forest illumined by a gibbous moon met my eyes nothing else yet this sight was welcome and it was only after i had been struck by the possibility of my own figure being seen at the casement by some possible watcher in the shadows below that i found the hardihood necessary to withdraw into the darker precincts of the room and begin that lonely watch which my doubts and expectations rendered necessary this was the third i had been forced to keep and it was by far the most dismal for though the bolted door between me and the hall promised me personal safety there presently rose in some far-off place a smothered repetition of that same 
tap 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 which had sent the shudders over me upon my sudden entrance into the house early in the morning heard now it caused me to tremble in a way i had not supposed possible to one of my hardy nature and while with this recognition of my feminine susceptibility to impressions there came a certain pride in the staunchness of purpose which led me to restrain all acknowledgment of fear by any recourse to my whistle i was more than glad when even this sound ceased and i had only to expect the swishing noise of a skirt down the hall and that stealthy locking of the door of the room i had taken the precaution of leaving it came sooner than i expected came just in the way it had previously done only that the person paused a moment to listen before hastening back the silence within must have satisfied her for i heard a low sigh like that of relief before the steps took themselves back that they would turn my way gave me a momentary concern but i had too completely lulled my young hostess's suspicions or let me be faithful to all the possibilities of the case they had put too much confidence in the powder with which they had seasoned my nightly cup of tea for them to doubt that i was soundly asleep in my own quarters three minutes later i followed those steps as far down the corridor as i dared to go for since my last appearance in it a candle had been lit in the main hall and faint as was its glimmer it was still a glimmer into the circle of which i felt it would be foolhardiness for me to step at some twenty paces then from the opening i paused and gave myself up to listening alas there was plenty now for me to hear you have heard the sound we all have heard the sound but few of us in such a desolate structure and at the hour and under the influences of midnight the measured tread of men struggling under a heavy weight and that weight how well i knew it as well as if i had seen it as i really did in my imagination they advanced from the adjoining corridor from the room i had as yet found no opportunity of entering and they approached surely and slowly the main hall near which i was standing in such a position as rendered it impossible for me to see anything if they took the direct course to the head of the stairs and so down as there was every reason to expect they would i did not dare to draw nearer however so concentrated my faculties anew upon listening when suddenly i perceived on the great white wall in front of me the wall of the main hall i mean toward which the opening looked the shapeless outline of a drooping head and realized that the candle had been placed in such a position that the wall must receive the full shadow of the passing cortege and thus it was i saw it huge distorted and suggestive beyond any picture i ever beheld the passing of a body to its long home carried by six anxious figures four of which seemed to be those of women but that long home where was it located in the house or in the grounds it was a question so important that for a moment i could think of nothing but how i could follow the small procession without running the risk of discovery it had reached the head of the stairs by this time and i heard miss knollys's low firm voice enjoining silence then the six bearers began to descend with their burden ere they reached the foot a doubt struck me would it be better to follow them or to take the opportunity afforded by every member of the household being engaged in this task to take a peep into the room where the death had occurred i had not decided when i heard them take the forward course from the foot of the stairs to what to my straining ear seemed to be the entrance to the dining-room corridor 
but as in my anxiety to determine this fact i slipped far enough forward to make sure that their destination lay somewhere within reach of the flower parlour i was so struck by the advantages to be gained by a cautious use of the trap-door in william's room that i hesitated no longer but sped with what swiftness i could toward the spot from which i had so lately heard this strange procession advance a narrow band of light lying across the upper end of the long corridor proved that the door was not only ajar but that a second candle was burning in the room i was about to invade but this was scarcely to be regretted since there could be no question of the emptiness of the room the six figures i had seen go by embraced every one who by any possibility could be considered as having part in this transaction william mr simsbury miss knollys lucetta hannah and mother jane no one else was left to guard this room so i pushed the door open quite boldly and entered what i saw there i will relate later or rather i will but hint at now a bed with a sheet thrown back a stand covered with vials a bureau with a man's shaving paraphernalia upon it and on the wall such pictures as only sporting gentlemen delight in the candle was guttering on a small table upon which to my astonishment a bible lay open not having my glasses with me i could not see what portion of the sacred word was thus disclosed but i took the precaution to indent the upper leaf with my thumbnail so that i might find it again in case of future opportunity my attention was attracted by other small matters that would be food for thought at a more propitious moment but at that instant the sound of voices coming distinctly to my ear from below warned me that a halt had been made at the flower parlour and that the duty of the moment was to locate the trap-door and if possible determine the means of raising it this was less difficult than i anticipated either this room was regarded as so safe from intrusion that a secret like this could be safely left unguarded or the door which was plainly to be seen in one corner had been so lately lifted that it had hardly sunk back into its place i found it if the expression may be used of a horizontal object slightly ajar and needing but the slightest pull to make it spring upright the hole thus disclosed was filled with the little staircase up which i had partly mounted in my daring explorations of the day before it was dark now darker than it was then but i felt that i must descend by it for plainly to be heard now through the crack in the closet door which seemed to have a knack of standing partly open i could hear the heavy tread of the six bearers as they entered the parlour below still carrying their burden concerning the destination of which i was so anxious to be informed that it could be in the room itself was too improbable for consideration yet if they took up their stand in this room it was for a purpose and what that purpose was i was determined to know the noise their feet made on the bare boards of the floor and the few words i now heard uttered in william's stolid tones and lucetta's musical treble assured me that my own light steps would no more be heard than my dark gown of quiet wool would be seen through the narrow slit through which i was preparing to peer yet it took no small degree of what my father used to call pluck for me to put foot on this winding staircase and descend almost as it were into the midst of what i must regard as the last wicked act of a most cowardly and brutal murder i did it however and after a short but grim communion with my own heart which would persist in beating somewhat noisily i leaned forward 
with all the precaution possible and let my gaze traverse the chamber in which i had previously seen such horrors as should have prepared me for this last and greatest one in a moment i understood the whole a long square hole in the floor lately sawed provided an opening through which the plain plank coffin of which i now caught sight was to be lowered into the cellar and so into the grave which had doubtless been dug there the ropes in the hands of the six persons in whose identity i had made no mistake was proof enough of their intention and satisfied as i now was of the means and mode of the interment which had been such a boundless mystery to me i shrank a step upward fearing lest my indignation and the horror i could not but feel from this moment on of althea's children would betray me into some exclamation which might lead to my discovery and a similar fate one other short glance in which i saw them all ranged around the dark opening and i was up out of their reach lucetta's face and lucetta's one sob as the ropes began to creak being the one memory which followed me the most persistently she at least was overwhelmed with remorse for a deed she was perhaps only answerable for in that she failed to make known to the world her brother's madness and the horrible crimes to which it gave rise i took one other look around his room before i fled to my own or rather to the one in which i had taken refuge while my own was under lock and key that i spent the next two hours on my knees no one can wonder when my own room was unlocked as it was before the day broke i hastened to enter it and lay my head with all its unhappy knowledge on my pillow but i did not sleep and what was stranger still never once thought of sounding a single note on the whistle which would have brought the police into this abode of crime perhaps it was a wise omission i had seen enough that was horrible that night without beholding althea's children arrested before my eyes end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Three, Forward and Back, Room Three, Hotel Carter. I rose at my usual hour. I dressed myself with my usual care. I was, to a superficial observer at least, in all respects my usual self when Hannah came to my door to ask what she could do for me as there was nothing i wanted but to get out of this house which had become unbearable to me i replied with the utmost cheerfulness that my wants were all supplied and that i would soon be down at which she answered that in that case she must bestir herself or the breakfast would not be ready and hurried away there was no one in the dining-room when i entered and judging from appearances that several minutes must elapse before breakfast would be ready i took occasion to stroll through the grounds and glance up at the window of william's room the knot of crape was gone i would have gone farther but just then i heard a great rushing and scampering and looking up saw an enormous dog approaching at full gallop from the stables saracen was loose I did not scream or give way to other feminine expressions of fear, but I did return as quickly as possible to the house, where I now saw I must remain till William chose to take me into town. This I was determined should take place as soon after breakfast as practicable. The knowledge which I now possessed warranted, nay demanded, instant consultation with the police and as this could best be effected by following out the orders i had received from mr gryce 
i did not consider any other plan than that of meeting the man on duty in room number three at the hotel loreen lucetta and william were awaiting me in the hall and made no apology for the flurry into which i had been thrown by my rapid escape from saracen indeed i doubt if they noticed it for with all the attempt they made to seem gay and at ease the anxieties and fatigue of the foregoing nights were telling upon them and from miss knollys down they looked physically exhausted but they also looked mentally relieved in the clear depths of lucetta's eye there was now no wavering and the head which was always turning in anxious anticipation over her shoulder rested firm though not as erect as her sisters who had less cause perhaps for regret and sorrow william was joyful to a degree but it was a forced joviality which only became real when he heard a sudden quick bark under the window and the sound of scraping paws against the mastic coating of the wall outside then he broke out into a loud laugh of unrestrained pleasure crying out thoughtlessly there's saracen how quick he knows a warning look from lucetta stopped him i mean he stammered it's a dull dog that cannot find his master miss butterworth you will have to overcome your fear of dogs if you stay with us long saracen is unbound this morning and he used a great oath he's going to remain so by which i came to understand that it was not out of consideration for me he had been tied up in the court till now but for reasons connected with their own safety and the preservation of the secret which they so evidently believed had been buried with the body which i did not like to remember lay at that very minute too nearly under our feet for my own individual comfort however this has nothing to do with the reply i made to william i hope he does not run with the buggy i objected i want to take a ride very much this morning and could get small pleasure out of it if that dog must be our companion i cannot go out this morning william began but changed his sentence possibly at the touch of his sister's foot under the table into but if you say i must why i must you women folks are so plagued unreasonable had he been ten years younger i would have boxed his ears had he been that much older i would have taken cue and packed my trunk before he could have finished the cup of coffee he was drinking but he was just too old to reprimand in the way just mentioned and not old enough to appreciate any display of personal dignity or self-respect on the part of the person he had offended besides he was a knave so i just let his impertinence pass with the remark i have purchases to make in the village and so that matter ended manifestly to the two girls relief who naturally did not like to see me insulted even if they did not possess sufficient power over their brother to prevent it one other small episode and then i will take you with me to the village as we were leaving the table where i ate less than common notwithstanding all my efforts to seem perfectly unconcerned lucetta who had waited for her brother to go out took me gently by the arm and eyeing me closely said did you have any dreams last night miss butterworth you know i promised you some the question disconcerted me and for a moment i felt like taking the two girls into my confidence and bidding them fly from the shame and doom so soon to fall upon their brother but the real principle underlying all such momentary impulses on my part deterred me and in as light a tone as i could command and not be an absolute hypocrite i replied that i was sorry to disappoint her but i had had no dreams which seemed to please her more than it should for if i had had no dreams i certainly had suffered from the most frightful realities i will not describe our ride into town saracen did go with us and indignation not only rendered me speechless but gave to my thoughts a turn which made that half hour of very little value to me mother jane's burly figure crouching in her doorway 
might otherwise have given me opportunity for remark and so might the dubious looks of people we met on the high road looks to which i am so wholly unaccustomed that i had difficulty in recognizing myself as the butt of so much doubt and possibly dislike i attributed this however all to the ill repute under which william so deservedly laboured and did not allow myself to more than notice it indeed i could only be sorry for people who did not know in what consideration i was held at home and who either through ignorance or prejudice allowed themselves privileges they would be the first to regret did they know the heart and mind of amelia butterworth once in the village i took the direction of affairs set me down at the hotel i commanded and then go about such business as you may have here in town i am not going to allow myself to be tracked all over by that dog i have no business was the surly reply then make some was my sharp retort i want to see the locksmith that locksmith who wouldn't come to do an honest piece of work for me in your house and i want to buy dimities and wools and sewing silks at the dry goods store over there indeed i have a thousand things to do and expect to spend half the morning before the counters why man i haven't done any shopping for a week he gaped at me perfectly aghast as i meant he should and having but little experience of city ladies took me at my word and prepared to beat an honourable retreat as a result i found myself ten minutes later standing on the top step of the hotel porch watching william driving away with saracen perched on the seat beside him then i realised that the village held no companions for him and did not know whether i felt glad or sorry to the clerk who came to meet me i said quietly room number three if you please at which he gave a nod of intelligence and led me as unostentatiously as possible into a small hall at the end of which i saw a door with the aforesaid number on it if you will take a seat inside said he i will send you whatever you may desire for your comfort i think you know what that is i rejoined at which he nodded again and left me closing the door carefully behind him as he went the few minutes which elapsed before my quiet was disturbed were spent by me in thinking there were many little questions to settle in my own mind for which a spell of uninterrupted contemplation was necessary one of these was whether in the event of finding the police amenable i should reveal or hide from these children of my old friend the fact that it was through my instrumentality that their nefarious secret had been discovered i wished nay i hoped that the affair might be so concluded but the possibility of doing so seemed so problematical especially since mr gryce was not on hand to direct matters that i spent very little time on the subject deep and important as it was to all concerned what most occupied me was the necessity of telling my story in such a way as to exonerate the girls as much as possible they were mistaken in their devotion and most unhappy in the exercise of it but they were not innately wicked and should not be made to appear so perhaps the one thing for which i should yet have the best cause to congratulate myself would be the opportunity i had gained of giving to their connection with this affair its true and proper colouring i was still dwelling on this thought when there came a knock at my door which advised me that the visitor i expected had arrived to open and admit him was the work of a moment but it took more than a moment for me to overcome my surprise at seeing in my visitor no lesser person than mr gryce himself who in our parting interview had assured me he was too old and too feeble for further detective work and must therefore delegate it to me ah i ejaculated slowly it is you is it well i am not surprised 
I shouldn't have been. When you say you are old, you mean old enough to pull the wool over other people's eyes, and when you say you are lame, you mean that you only halt long enough to let others get far enough ahead for them not to see how fast you hobble up behind them. But do not think I am not happy to see you. I am, Mr. Grice, for I have discovered the secret of Lost Man's Lane, and find it somewhat too heavy a one for my own handling. To my surprise, he showed this was more than he expected. You have, he asked, with just that shade of incredulity which it is so tantalizing to encounter. Then I suppose congratulations are in order. But are you sure, Miss Butterworth, that you really have obtained a clue to the many strange and fearful disappearances which have given to this lane its name? Quite sure, I returned, nettled. Why do you doubt it? Because I have kept so quiet and not sounded one note of alarm from my whistle? No, said he. Knowing your self-restraint so well, I cannot say that that is my reason. What is it, then? I urged. Well, said he, my real reason for doubting if you have been quite as successful as you think is that we ourselves have come upon a clue about which there can be no question. Can you say the same of yours? You will expect my answer to have been a decided yes, uttered with all the positiveness of which you know me capable. But for some reason, perhaps because of the strange influence this man's personality exercises upon all, yes, all, who do not absolutely steel themselves against him, I faltered just long enough for him to cry, I thought not. The clue is outside the Knollys house, not in it, Miss Butterworth, for which, of course, you are not to be blamed or your services scorned. I have no doubt they have been invaluable in unearthing a secret, if not the secret. Thank you, was my quiet retort. I thought his presumption beyond all bounds, and would at that moment have felt justified in snapping my fingers at the clue he boasted of, had it not been for one thing. What that thing is, I am not ready yet to state." "'You and I have come to issue over such matters before,' said he, "'and therefore need not take too much account of the feelings it is likely to engender. "'I will merely state that my clue points to Mother Jane, "'and ask if you have found in the visit she paid at the house last night "'anything which would go to strengthen the suspicion against her.' "'Perhaps,' said I in a state of disdain that was more or less unpardonable, considering that my own suspicions, previous to my discovery of the real tragedy enacted under my eyes at the Knollys mansion, had played more or less about this old crone. Only perhaps, he smiled, with a playful forbearance, for which I should have been truly grateful to him. She was there for no good purpose, said I. And yet, if you had not characterized her as the person most responsible for the crimes we are here to investigate, I should have said from all that I then saw of her conduct that she acted as a supernumerary rather than principal, and that it is to me you should look for the correct clue to the criminal, notwithstanding your confidence in your own theories and my momentary hesitation to assert that there was no possible defect in mine. Miss Butterworth, I thought he looked a trifle shaken. What did Mother Jane do in that closely shuttered house last night? Mother Jane? Well, did he think I was going to introduce my tragic story by telling what Mother Jane did? I must have looked irritated, and indeed I think I had cause. Mother Jane ate her supper, I snapped out angrily. Miss Knollys gave it to her. Then she helped a little with a piece of work they had on hand. It will not interest you to know what. It has nothing to do with your clue, I warrant. He did not get angry. He has an admirable temper, has Mr. Grice. 
but he did stop a minute to consider. Miss Butterworth, he said at last, most detectives would have held their peace and let you go on with what you have to tell without a hint that it was either unwelcome or unnecessary. But I have consideration for persons' feelings and for persons' secrets, so long as they do not come in collision with the law, and my opinion is, or was when I entered this room, that such discoveries as you have made at your old friend's house, why need he emphasize friend? Did he think I forgot for a moment that Althea was my friend? Were connected rather with some family difficulty than with the dreadful affair we are considering. That is why I hasten to tell you that we had found a clue to the disappearances in Mother Jane's cottage. I wished to save the Mrs. Knollys. If he had thought to mollify me by this assertion, he did not succeed. He saw it and made haste to say, Not that I doubt your consideration for them, only the justness of your conclusions. You have doubted those before and with more reason, I replied, yet they were not altogether false. That I am willing to acknowledge, so willing that if you still think after I have told my story that yours is apropos, then I will listen to it only too eagerly. My object is to find the real criminal in this matter. I say at the present moment it is Mother Jane. God grant you are right, I said, influenced in spite of myself by the calm assurance of his manner. If she was at the house night before last between eleven and twelve, then perhaps she is all you think her. But I see no reason to believe it. Not yet, Mr. Grice. Supposing you give me one, it would be better than all this controversy. One small reason, Mr. Grice, as good as, I did not say what, but the fillip it gave to his intention stood me in good stead, for he launched immediately into the matter, with no further play upon my curiosity, which was now, as you can believe, thoroughly aroused, though I could not believe that anything he had to bring up against Mother Jane could for a moment stand against the death and the burial I had witnessed in Miss Knollys's house during the two previous nights. End of chapter 23「twenty four of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Enigma of Numbers. When in our first conversation on this topic I told you that Mother Jane was not to be considered in this matter, I meant she was not to be considered by you. She was a subject to be handled by the police, and we have handled her. Yesterday afternoon I made a search of her cabin. Here Mr. Grice paused and eyed me quizzically. He sometimes does eye me, which same I cannot regard as a compliment, considering how fond he is of concentrating all his wisdom upon small and insignificant objects. I wonder, said he, what you would have done in such a search as that. It was no common one, I assure you. There are not many hiding places between Mother Jane's four walls. I felt myself begin to tremble, with eagerness, of course. I wish I had been given the opportunity, said I. That is, if anything was to be found there. He seemed to be in a sympathetic mood toward me, or perhaps, and this is the likelier supposition, he had a minute of leisure and thought he could afford to give himself a little quiet amusement. However that was, he answered me by saying, The opportunity is not lost. You have been in her cabin, and have noted, I have no doubt, its extreme simplicity. Yet it contains, or rather did contain up till last night, distinct evidences of more than one of the crimes which have been perpetrated in this lane. Good. And you want me to guess where you found them? Well, it's not fair. Ah, 
and why not because you probably did not find them on your first attempt you had time to look about i am asked to guess at once and without second trial what i warrant it took you several trials to determine he could not help but laugh and why do you think it took me several trials because there is more than one thing in that room made up of parts parts he attempted to look puzzled but i would not have it you know what i mean i declared seventy parts twenty-eight or whatever the numbers are she so constantly mutters his admiration was unqualified and sincere miss butterworth said he you are a woman after my own heart how came you to think that her mutterings had anything to do with a hiding place because it did not have anything to do with the amount of money i gave her when i handed her twenty-five cents she cried seventy twenty-eight and now ten ten what not ten cents or ten dollars but ten why do you stop i do not want to risk my reputation on a guess there is a quilt on the bed made up of innumerable pieces there is a floor of neatly laid brick and there is a bible on the stand whose leaves number many over seventy ah it was in the bible you found his smile put mine quite to shame i must acknowledge he cried that i looked in the bible but i found nothing there beyond what we all seek when we open its sacred covers shall i tell my story he was evidently bursting with pride you would think that after a half century of just such successes a man would take his honours more quietly but pshaw human nature is just the same in the old as in the young he was no more tired of compliment or of awakening the astonishment of those he confided in than when he aroused the admiration of the force by his triumphant handling of the leavenworth case of course in presence of such weakness i could do nothing less than give him a sympathetic ear i may be old myself some day besides his story was likely to prove more or less interesting tell your story i repeated don't you see that i am i was going to say on pins and needles till i hear it but the expression is too vulgar for a woman of my breeding so i altered the words happily before they were spoken into that i am in a state of the liveliest curiosity concerning the whole matter tell your story of course well miss butterworth if i do it is because i know you will appreciate it you like myself placed weight upon the numbers she is for ever running over and you like myself have conceived the possibility of these numbers having reference to something in the one room she inhabits at first glance the extreme bareness of the spot seemed to promise nothing to my curiosity i looked at the floor and detected no signs of any disturbance having taken place in its symmetrically laid bricks for years yet i counted up to seventy one way and twenty-eight the other and marking the brick thus selected began to pry it out it came with difficulty and showed me nothing underneath but green mould and innumerable frightened insects then i counted the bricks the other way but nothing came of it the floor does not appear to have been disturbed for years turning my attention away from the floor i began upon the quilt this was a worse job than the other and it took me an hour to rip apart the block i settled upon as the suspicious one but my labour was entirely wasted there was no hidden treasure in the quilt then i searched the walls using the measurements seventy by twenty-eight but no result followed these endeavours and well what do you think i did then you will tell me i said if i give you one more minute to do it in very well said he i see you do not know madam having searched below and around me i next turned my attention overhead do you remember the strings and strings of dried vegetables 
that decorate the beams above. I do, I replied, not stinting any of the astonishment I really felt. Well, I began to count them next, and when I reached the seventieth onion from the open doorway, I crushed it between my fingers, and these fell out, madam, worthless trinkets, as you will immediately see, but, well, well, I urged, they have been identified as belonging to the peddler who was one of the victims in whose fate we are interested. Ah, ah, I ejaculated, somewhat amazed, I own. And number 28? That was a carrot, and it held a really valuable ring, a ruby surrounded by diamonds. If you remember, I once spoke to you of this ring. It was the property of young Mr. Chittenden, and worn by him while he was in this village. He disappeared on his way to the railway station, having taken, as many can vouch, the short detour by Lost Man's Lane, which would lead him directly by Mother Jane's cottage. "'You thrill me,' said I, keeping down with admirable self-possession my own thoughts in regard to this matter. "'And what of number ten, beyond which she said she could not count?' "'In ten was your twenty-five-cent piece, and in various other vegetables, small coins, whose value taken collectively would not amount to a dollar. The only numbers which seemed to make any impression on her mind were those connected with these crimes. Very good evidence, Miss Butterworth, that Mother Jane holds the clue to this matter, even if she is not responsible for the death of the individuals represented by this property. Certainly, I acquiesced. And if you examined her after her return from the Knollis mansion last night, you would probably have found upon her some similar evidence of her complicity in the last crime of this terrible series. It would needs have been small, as silly Rufus neither indulged in the brass trinkets sold by the old peddler, nor the real jewellery of a well-to-do man like Mr. Chittenden. Silly Rufus? He was the last to disappear from these parts, was he not? Yes, madam. And as such, should have left some clue to his fate in the hands of this old crone, if her motive in removing him was, as you seem to think, entirely that of gain. I did not say it was entirely so. Silly Rufus would be the last person any one, even such a non compus mentis as Mother Jane, would destroy for hope of gain. But what other motive could she have? And, Mr. Grice, where could she bestow the bodies of so many unfortunate victims, even if by her great strength she could succeed in killing them? There you have me, said he. We have not been able as yet to unearth any bodies. Have you? No, said I with some little show of triumph showing through my disdain, but I can show you where to unearth one. He should have been startled, profoundly startled. Why wasn't he? I asked this of myself over and over in the one instant he weighed his words before answering. You have made some definite discoveries then, he declared. You have come across a grave or a mound which you have taken for a grave. I shook my head. No mound, said I. Why should I not play for an instant or more with his curiosity? He had with mine. Ah, then, why do you talk of unearthing? No one has told you where you can lay hand on silly Rufus's body, I take it. No, said I. The Knollis house is not inclined to give up its secrets. He started, glancing almost remorsefully, first at the tip, then at the head of the cane he was balancing in his hand. It's too bad, he muttered, but you've been led astray, Miss Butterworth. Excusably, I acknowledge, quite excusably, but yet in a way to give you quite wrong conclusions. The secret of the Knollis house, but wait a moment, then you were not locked up in your room last night. Scarcely, I returned. 
wavering between the doubts he had awakened by his first sentence and the surprise which his last could not fail to give me i might have known they would not be likely to catch you in a trap he remarked so you were up and in the halls i was up i acknowledged and in the halls may i ask where you were he paid no heed to the last sentence this complicates matters said he and yet perhaps it is as well i understand you now and in a few minutes you will understand me you thought it was silly rufus who was buried last night that was rather an awful thought miss butterworth i wonder with that in your mind you look as well as you do this morning madam truly you are a wonderful woman a very wonderful woman a truce to compliments i begged if you know as much as your words imply of what went on in that ill-omened house last night you ought to show some degree of emotion yourself for if it was not silly rufus who was laid away under the flower parlour who then was it no one for whom tears could openly be shed or of whose death public acknowledgment could be made or we would not be sitting here talking away at cross purposes the morning after his burial tears are not shed or public acknowledgment made for the subject of a half crazy man's love for scientific investigation it was no human being whom you saw buried madam but a victim of mr knollys's passion for vivisection you are playing with me was my indignant answer outrageously and inexcusably playing with me only a human being would be laid away in such secrecy and with such manifestations of feeling as i was witness to you must think me in my dotage or else we will take the rest of the sentence for granted he dryly interpolated you know that i can have no wish to insult your intelligence miss butterworth and that if i advance a theory on my own account i must have ample reasons for it now can you say the same for yours can you adduce irrefutable proof that the body we buried last night was that of a man if you can there is no more to be said or rather there is everything to be said for this would give to the transaction a very dreadful and tragic significance which at present i am not disposed to ascribe to it taken aback by his persistence but determined not to acknowledge defeat until forced to it i stolidly replied you have made an assertion and it is for you to adduce proof it will be time enough for me to talk when your own theory is proved untenable he was not angry fellow feeling for my disappointment made him unusually gentle his voice was therefore very kind when he said madam if you know it to have been a man say so i do not wish to waste my time i do not know it very well then i will tell you why i think my supposition true mr knollys as you probably have already discovered is a man with a secret passion for vivisection yes i have discovered that it is known to his family and it is known to a very few others but it is not known to the world at large not even to his fellow villagers i can believe it said i his sisters who are gentle girls regard the matter as the gentle-hearted usually do they have tried in every way to influence him to abandon it but unsuccessfully so far for he is not only entirely unamenable to persuasion but has a nature of such brutality he could not live without some such excitement to help away his life in this dreary house all they can do then is to conceal these cruelties from the eyes of the people who already execrate him for his many roughnesses and the undoubted shadow under which he lives time was when i thought this shadow had a substance worth our investigation but a further knowledge of his real fault and a completer knowledge of his sister's virtues turned my inquiries in a new direction 
where i have found as i have told you actual reason for arresting mother jane have you anything to say against these conclusions cannot you see that all your suspicions can be explained by the brother's cruel impulses and the sister's horror of having those impulses known i thought a moment then i cried out boldly no i cannot mr gryce the anxiety the fear which i have seen depicted on these sisters faces for days might be explained perhaps by this theory but the knot of crape on the window shutter the open bible in the room of death william's room mr gryce proclaim that it was a human being and nothing less for whom lucetta's sobs went up i do not follow you he said moved for the first time from his composure what do you mean by a knot of crape and when was it you obtained entrance into william's room ah i exclaimed in dry retort you are beginning to see that i have something as interesting to report as yourself did you think me a superficial egotist without facts to back my assertions i should not have done you that injustice i have penetrated i think deeper than even yourself into william's character i think him capable but do satisfy my curiosity on one point first mr gryce how came you to know as much as you do about last night's proceedings you could not have been in the house did mother jane talk after she got back the tip of his cane was up and he frowned at it then the handle took its place and he gave it a good-natured smile miss butterworth said he i have not succeeded in making mother jane at any time go beyond her numerical monologue but you have been more successful and with a sudden marvellous change of expression pose and manner he threw over his head my shawl which had fallen to the floor in my astonishment and rocking himself to and fro before me muttered grimly seventy twenty-eight ten no more i can count no more go mr gryce it was you whom you interviewed in mother jane's cottage with mr knollys he finished and it was i who helped to bury what you now declare to my real terror and astonishment to have been a human being miss butterworth what about the knot of crape tell me end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain trifles but not trifling i was so astounded i hardly took in this final question he had been the sixth party in the funeral cortege i had seen pause in the flower parlour well what might i not expect from this man next but i am methodical even under the greatest excitement and at the most critical instance as those who have read that affair next door have had ample opportunity to know once having taken in the startling fact he mentioned i found it impossible to proceed to establish my standpoint till i knew a little more about his wait i said tell me first if i have ever seen the real mother jane or were you the person i saw stooping in the road and of whom i bought the penny royal no he replied that was the old woman herself my appearance in the cottage dates from yesterday noon i felt the need of being secretly near you and i also wished for an opportunity to examine this humble interior unsuspected and unobserved so i prevailed upon the old woman to exchange places with me she taking up her abode in the woods for the night and i her old stool on the hearthstone 
she was the more willing to do this from the promise i gave her to watch out for lizzie that i would don her own sunday suit and personate her in her own home she evidently did not suspect had not wit enough i suppose at the present moment she is back in her old place i nodded my thanks for this explanation but was not deterred from pressing the point i was anxious to have elucidated if i went on to urge you took advantage of your disguise to act as assistant in the burial which took place last night you are in a much better situation than myself to decide the question we are at present considering was it because of any secret knowledge thus gained you declare so positively that it was not a human being you helped lower in its grave partially having some skill in these disguises especially where my own infirmities can have full play as in the case of this strong but half-bent woman i had no reason to think my own identity was suspected much less discovered therefore i could trust to what i saw and heard as being just what mother jane herself would be allowed to see or hear under the same circumstances if therefore these young people and this old crone had been as you seem to think they are in league for murder lucetta would hardly have greeted me as she did when she came down to meet me in the kitchen and how was that what did she say she said ah mother jane we have a piece of work for you you are strong are you not hm. and then she commiserated me a bit and gave me food which upon my word i found hard to eat though i had saved my appetite for the occasion before she left me she bade me sit in the ingle nook till she wanted me adding in hannah's ear as she passed her there is no use trying to explain anything to her show her when the time comes what there is to do and trust to her short memory to forget it before she leaves the house she could not understand my brother's propensity or our shame in pandering to it so attempt nothing hannah only keep the money in her view so and that gave you no idea it gave me the idea i have imparted to you or rather added to the idea which had been instilled in me by others and this idea was not affected by what you saw afterwards not in the least rather strengthened of the few words i overheard one was uttered in reference to yourself by miss knollys she said i have locked miss butterworth again into her room if she accuses me of having done so i shall tell her our whole story better she should know the family's disgrace than imagine us guilty of crimes of which we are utterly incapable so so i cried you heard that yes madam i heard that and i do not think she knew she was dropping that word into the ear of a detective but on this point you are of course at liberty to differ with me i am not yet ready to avail myself of the privilege i retorted what else did these girls let fall in your hearing not much it was hannah who led me into the upper hall and hannah who by signs and signals rather than words showed me what was expected of me however when after the box was lowered into the cellar hannah was drawing me away lucetta stepped up and whispered in her ear don't give her the biggest coin give her the little one or she may mistake our reasons for secrecy i wouldn't like even a fool to do that even for the moment it would remain lodged in mother jane's mind well well i again cried certainly puzzled for these stray expressions of the sisters were in a measure contradictory not only of the suspicions i entertained but of the facts which had seemingly come to my attention mr gryce who was probably watching my face more closely than he did the cane with whose movements he was apparently engrossed stopped to give a caressing rub to the knob of that same cane before remarking one such peep behind the scenes 
is worth any amount of surmise expended on the wrong side of the curtain. I let you share my knowledge because it is your due. Now, if you feel willing to explain what you mean by a knot of crape on the shutter, I am at your service, madam. I felt that it would be cruel to delay my story longer, and so I began it. It was evidently more interesting than he expected, and as I dilated upon the special features which had led me to believe that it was a thinking, suffering mortal like ourselves who had been shut up in William's room and afterwards buried in the cellar under the flower parlour, I saw his face lengthen and doubt take the place of the quiet assurance with which he had received my various intimations up to this time. The cane was laid aside, and from the action of his right forefinger on the palm of his left hand, I judged that I was making no small impression on his mind. When I had finished, he sat for a minute silent. Then he said, Thanks, Miss Butterworth. You have more than fulfilled my hopes. What we buried was undoubtedly human. And the question now is, who was it? And of what death did he die? Then, after a meaning pause, you think it was silly Rufus. I will astonish you with my reply. No, said I, I do not. That is where you make a mistake, Mr. Grice. End of chapter 25「Twenty Six of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Point Gained He was surprised for all his attempts to conceal it. No, said he. Who then? You are becoming interesting, Miss Butterworth. This I thought I could afford to ignore. Yesterday, I proceeded, I would have declared it to be silly Rufus in the face of God and man. But after what I saw in William's room during the hurried survey I gave it, I am inclined to doubt if the explanation we have to give to this affair is so simple as that would make it. Mr. Grice, in one corner of that room, from which the victim had so lately been carried, was a pair of shoes that could never have been worn by any boy tramp I have ever seen or known of. They were Lorene's, or possibly Lucetta's. No, Lorene and Lucetta both have trim feet, but these were the shoes of a child of ten, very dainty at that, and of a cut and make worn by women, or rather, I should say, by girls. Now, what do you make of that? He did not seem to know what to make of it. Tap, tap, went his finger on his seasoned palm, and as I watched the slowness with which it fell, I said to myself, I have proposed a problem this time that will tax even Mr. Grice's powers of deduction. And I had. It was minutes before he ventured an opinion, and then it was with a shade of doubt in his tone that I acknowledged to have felt some pride in producing. They were Lucetta's shoes. The emotions under which you laboured, very pardonable emotions, madam, considering the circumstances and the hour. Excuse me, said I, we do not want to waste a moment. I was excited, suitably and duly excited, or I would have been a stone. But I never lose my head under excitement, nor do I part with my sense of proportion. The shoes were not Lucetta's. She never wore any approaching them in smallness since her tenth year. Has Simsbury a daughter? Has there not been a child about the house some time to assist the cook in errands and so on? No, or I should have seen her. Besides, how would the shoes of such a person come into William's room? Easily. Secrecy was required. You were not to be disturbed. 
so shoes were taken off that quiet might result. Was Lucetta shoeless, or William, or even Mother Jane? You have not told me that you were requested to walk in stocking feet up the hall. No, Mr. Grice, the shoes were the shoes of a girl. I know it because it was matched by a dress I saw hanging up in a sort of wardrobe. Ah, you looked into the wardrobe? I did, and felt justified in doing so. It was after I had spied the shoes. Very good. And you saw a dress? A little dress, a dress with a short skirt. It was of silk, too. Another anomaly, and the colour, I think, was blue, but I cannot swear to that point. I was in great haste and took the briefest glance. But my brief glances can be trusted, Mr. Grice. That, I think, you are beginning to know. Certainly, said he, and as proof of it, we will now act upon these two premises, that the victim in whose burial I was an innocent partaker was a human being, and that this human being was a girl-child who came into the house well-dressed. Now where does that lead us? Into a maze, I fear. We are accustomed to mazes, I observed. Yes, he answered somewhat gloomily, but they are not exactly desirable in this case. I want to find the Knollys family innocent. And I. But William's character, I fear, will make that impossible. But this girl, who is she, and where did she come from? No girl has been reported to us as missing from this neighbourhood. I supposed not. A visitor but no visitor could enter this house without it being known far and wide. Why, I heard of your arrival here before I left the train on which I followed you. Had we allowed ourselves to be influenced by what the people about here say, we would have turned the Knollys house inside out a week ago. But I don't believe in putting too much confidence in the prejudice of country people. The idea they suggested and which you suggest, without putting it too clearly into words, is much too horrible to be acted upon without the best of reasons. Perhaps we have found those reasons. Yet I still feel like asking, where did this girl come from, and how could she have become a prisoner in the Knollys house, without the knowledge of... Madam, have you met Mr. Trome? The question was so sudden, I had not time to collect myself, but perhaps it was not necessary that I should, for the simple affirmation I used seemed to satisfy Mr. Grice, who went on to say, It is he who first summoned us here, and it is he who has the greatest interest in locating the source of these disappearances, yet he has seen no child come here. Mr. Trome is not a spy, said I but the remark, happily, fell unheeded. No one has, he pursued. We must give another turn to our suppositions. Suddenly a silence fell upon us both. His finger ceased to lay down the law, and my gaze, which had been searching his face inquiringly, became fixed. At the same moment, and in much the same tone of voice, we both spoke, he saying, ha, huh, and I, ah, as a prelude to the simultaneous exclamation, the phantom coach. We were so pleased with this discovery that we allowed a moment to pass in silent contemplation of each other's satisfaction. Then he quietly added, which on the evening preceding your arrival came from the mountains and passed into Lost Man's Lane from which no one ever saw it emerge. It was no phantom, I put in. It was their own old coach bringing to the house a fresh victim. This sounded so startling, we both sat still for a moment, lost in the horror of it. Then I spoke. People living in remote and isolated quarters like this are naturally superstitious. The Knollys family know this, and remembering the old legend, 
forbore to contradict the conclusions of their neighbours loreen's emotion when the topic was broached to her is explained by this theory it is not a pleasant one but we cannot be wrong in contemplating it not at all this apparition as they call it was seen by two persons therefore it was no apparition but a real coach it came from the mountains that is from the mountain station and it glided ah well mr gryce it was its noiselessness that gave it its spectral appearance now i remember a petty circumstance which i dare you to match in corroboration of our suspicions you do i could not repress a slight toss of my head yes i do i repeated he smiled and made the slightest of deprecatory gestures you have had advantages he began and disadvantages i finished determined that he should award me my full meed of praise you are probably not afraid of dogs i am you could visit the stables and did but i found nothing there i thought not i could not help the exclamation it is so seldom one can really triumph over this man not having the cue you would not be apt to see what gives this whole thing away i would never have thought of it again if we had not had this talk is mr simsbury a neat man a neat man madam what do you mean something important mr gryce if mr simsbury is a neat man he will have thrown away the old rags which i dare promise you cumbered his stable floor the morning after the phantom coach was seen to enter the lane if he is not you may still find them there one of them i know you will not find he pulled it off of his wheel with his whip the afternoon he drove me down from the station i can see the sly look he gave me as he did it it made no impression on me then but now madam you have supplied the one link necessary to the establishment of this theory allow me to felicitate you upon it but whatever our satisfaction may be from a professional standpoint we cannot but feel the unhappy nature of the responsibility incurred by these discoveries if this seemingly respectable family stooped to such subterfuge going to the length of winding rags around the wheels of their lumbering old coach to make it noiseless and even tying up their horses feet for this same purpose they must have had a motive dark enough to warrant your worst suspicions and william was not the only one involved simsbury at least had a hand in it nor does it look as if the girls were as innocent as we would like to consider them i cannot stop to consider the girls i declared i can no longer consider the girls nor i he gloomily assented our duty requires us to sift this matter and it shall be sifted we must first find if any child alighted from the cars at the mountain station on that especial night or what is more probable from the little station at c five miles farther back in the mountains and i urged seeing that he had still something to say we must make sure who lies buried under the floor of the room you call the flower parlour you may expect me at the knollis house some time to-day i shall come quietly but in my own proper person you are not to know me and unless you desire it need not appear in the matter i do not desire it then good morning miss butterworth my respect for your abilities has risen even higher than before we part in a similar frame of mind for once and this he expected me to regard as a compliment end of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
the text witnesseth i have a grim will when i choose to exert it after mr gryce left the hotel i took a cup of tea with the landlady and then made a round of the stores i bought dimity sewing silk and what not as i said i would but this did not occupy me long to the regret probably of the country merchants who expected to make a fool of me and found it a by no means easy task and was quite ready for william when he finally drove up the ride home was a more or less silent one i had conceived such a horror of the man beside me that talking for talk's sake was impossible while he was in a mood which it would be charity to call non-communicative it may be that my own reticence was at the bottom of this but i rather think not the remark he made in passing deacon spear's house showed that something more than spite was working in his slow but vindictive brain there's a man of your own sort he cried you won't find him doing anything out of the way oh no pity your visit wasn't paid there you'd have got a better impression of the lane to this i made no reply at mr trome's he spoke again i suppose that you and trome had the devil of a say about lucetta and the rest of us i don't know why but the whole neighbourhood seems to feel they've a right to use our name as they choose but it isn't going to be so long we have played poor and pinched and starved all i'm going to i'm going to have a new horse and lucetta shall have a dress and that mighty quick too i'm tired of all this shabbiness and mean to have a change i wanted to say no change yet change under the present circumstances would be the worst thing possible for you all but i felt that this would be treason to mr gryce and refrained saying simply as he looked sideways at me for a word lucetta needs a new dress that no one can deny but you had better let me get it for her or perhaps that is what you mean the grunt which was my only answer might be interpreted in any way i took it however for assent as soon as i was relieved of his presence and found myself again with the girls i altered my whole manner and cried out in querulous tones mrs carter and i have had a difference this was true we did have a difference over our cup of tea i did not think it necessary to say this difference was a forced one some things we are perfectly justified in keeping to ourselves she remembers a certain verse in the new testament one way and i in another we had not time to settle it by a consultation with the sacred word but i cannot rest till it is settled so will you bring your bible to me my dear that i may look that verse up we were in the upper hall where i had taken a seat on the old-fashioned sofa there lucetta who was standing before me started immediately to do my bidding without stopping to think poor child that it was very strange i did not go to my own room and consult my own bible as any good presbyterian would be expected to do as she was turning toward the large front room i stopped her with the quiet injunction get me one with good print lucetta my eyes won't bear much straining at which she turned and to my great relief hurried down the corridor toward william's room from which she presently returned bringing the very volume i was anxious to consult meanwhile i had laid aside my hat i felt flurried and unhappy and showed it lucetta's pitiful face had a strange sweetness in it this morning and i felt sure as i took the sacred book from her hand that her thoughts were all with the lover she had sent from her side and not at all with me or with what at the moment occupied me yet my thoughts at this moment involved without doubt the very deepest interests of her life if not that very lover she was brooding over in her darkened and resigned mind as i realized this i heaved an involuntary sigh which seemed to startle her 
for she turned and gave me a quick look as she was slipping away to join her sister, who was busy at the other end of the hall. The Bible I held was an old one, of medium size and most excellent print. I had no difficulty in finding the text and settling the question which had been my ostensible reason for wanting the book, but it took me longer to discover the indentation which I had made in one of its pages. But when I did, you may imagine my awe and the turmoil into which my mind was cast when I found that it marked those great verses in Corinthians which are so universally read at funerals. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. End of chapter 27「ちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっちゃっ on the part of some one of the Knollys family. Who was this one, and why, with such feelings in the breast of any of the three, had the deceit and crime to which I had been witness succeeded to such a point as to demand the attention of the police? An impossible problem, of which I dared seek no solution, even in the faces of these seemingly innocent girls. I was, of course, in no position to determine what plan Mr. Grice intended to pursue. I only knew what course I myself meant to follow, which was to remain quiet and sustain the part I had already played in this house as visitor and friend. It was therefore as such, both in heart and manner, that I hastened from my room late in the afternoon to inquire the meaning of the cry I had just heard issue from Lucetta's lips. It had come from the front of the house, and as I hastened thither, I met the two Mrs. Knollys, looking more openly anxious and distraught than at any former time of anxiety and trouble. As they looked up and saw my face, Lorene paused and laid her hand on Lucetta's arm, but Lucetta was not to be restrained. He has dared to enter our gates, bringing a police officer with him, was her hoarse and almost unintelligible cry. We know that the man with him is a police officer, because he was here once before, and though he was kind enough then, he cannot have come the second time except to... Here the pressure of Lorene's hand was so strong as to make the feeble Lucetta quiver. She stopped, and Miss Knollys took up her words except to make us talk on subjects much better buried in oblivion. Miss Butterworth, will you go down with us? Your presence may act as a restraint. Mr. Trome seems to have some respect for you. Mr. Trome? Yes, it is his coming which has so agitated Lucetta. He and a man named Grice are just coming up the walk. There goes the knocker. Lucetta, you must control yourself or leave me to face these unwelcome visitors alone. Lucetta, with a sudden fierce effort, subdued her trembling. If he must be met, said she, my anger and disdain may give some weight to your quiet acceptance of the family's disgrace. I shall not accept his denunciations quietly, Lorene. You must expect me to show some of the feelings that I have held in check all these years. And without waiting for reply, without waiting even to see what effect these strange words might have upon me, she dashed down the stairs and pulled open the front door. We had followed rapidly, too rapidly for speech ourselves, and were therefore in the hall when the door swung back, 
revealing the two persons I had been led to expect. Mr. Trone spoke first, evidently in answer to the defiance to be seen in Lucetta's face. "'Miss Knollys, a thousand pardons. I know I am transgressing, but I assure you the occasion warrants it. I am certain you will acknowledge this when you hear what my errand is.' "'Your errand? What can your errand be but to—' Why did she pause? Mr. Grice had not looked at her. Yet that it was under his influence she ceased to commit herself, I am as convinced as we can be of anything in a world which is half deceit. Let us hear your errand, put in Laurine, with that gentle emphasis which is no sign of weakness. I will let this gentleman speak for me, returned Mr. Trome. You have seen him before, a New York detective of whose business in this town you cannot be ignorant. Lucetta turned a cold eye upon Mr. Grice and quietly remarked, When he visited this lane a few days ago, he professed to be seeking a clue to the many disappearances which have unfortunately taken place within its precincts. Mr. Trome's nod was one of acquiescence, but Lucetta was still looking at the detective. "'Is that your business now?' she asked, appealing directly to Mr. Grice. His fatherly accents, when he answered her, were a great relief after the alternate iciness and fire with which she had addressed his companion and himself. "'I hardly know how to reply without arousing your just anger. "'If your brother is in, my brother would face you with less patience than we. "'Tell us your errand, Mr. Grice, and do not think of calling in my brother "'till we have failed to answer your questions or satisfy your demands.' "'Very well,' said he. "'The quickest explanation is the kindest in these cases.' I merely wish, as a police officer, whose business it is to locate the disappearances which have made this lane notorious, and who believes the surest way to do this is to find out once and for all where they did not and could not have taken place, to make an official search of these premises, as I already have those of Mother Jane and of Deacon Spear. And my errand here, interposed Mr. Trome, is to make everything easier by the assurance that my house will be the next to undergo a complete investigation. As all the houses in the lane will be visited alike, none of us need complain or feel our good name attacked. This was certainly thoughtful of him, but knowing how much they had to fear, I could not expect Laurine or Lucetta to show any great sense either of his kindness or Mr. Grice's consideration. They were in no position to have a search made of their premises, and, serene as was Laurine's nature, and powerful as was Lucetta's will, the apprehension under which they laboured was evident to us all, though neither of them attempted either subterfuge or evasion. If the police wish to search this house, it is open to them, said Laurine but not to Mr. Trome, quoth Lucetta quickly. Our poverty should be our protection from the curiosity of neighbours. Mr. Trome has no wish to intrude, was Mr. Grice's conciliatory remark, but Mr. Trome said nothing. He probably understood why Lucetta wished to curtail his stay in this house better than Mr. Grice did. End of chapter 28。chapter 29 of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。in the cellar。I had meanwhile stood silent。there was no reason for me to obtrude myself and I was happy not to do so. This does not mean, however, that my presence was not noticed. Mr. Trome honoured me with more than one glance during these trying moments, in which I read the anxiety he felt, lest my peace of mind should be too much disturbed. 
and when in response to the undoubted dismissal he had received from lucetta he prepared to take his leave it was upon me he bestowed his final look and most deferential bow it was a tribute to my position and character which all seemed to feel and i was not at all surprised when lucetta after carefully watching his departure turned to me with childlike impetuosity saying this must be very unpleasant for you miss butterworth yet must we ask you to stand our friend god knows we need one i shall never forget i occupied that position toward your mother was my straightforward reply and i did not forget it not for a moment i shall begin with the cellar mr gryce announced both girls quivered then Lorine lifted her proud head and said quietly, The whole house is at your disposal. Only I pray you to be as expeditious as possible. My sister is not well, and the sooner our humiliation is over, the better it will be for her. And indeed, Lucetta was in a state that aroused even Mr. Grice's anxiety. But when she saw us all hovering over her, she roused herself with an extraordinary effort and waving us aside led the way to the kitchen from which as i gathered the only direct access could be had to the cellar mr gryce immediately followed and behind him came lorine and myself both too much agitated to speak at the flower parlour mr gryce paused as if he had forgotten something but lucetta urged him feverishly on and before long we were all standing in the kitchen here a surprise awaited us two men were sitting there who appeared to be strangers to hannah from the lowering looks she cast them as she pretended to be busy over her stove this was so out of keeping with her usual good humour as to attract the attention even of her young mistress what is the matter hannah asked lucetta and who are these men they are my men said mr gryce the job i have undertaken cannot be carried on alone the quick look the two sisters interchanged did not escape me or the quiet air of resignation which was settling slowly over lorine must they go into the cellar too she asked mr gryce smiled his most fatherly smile as he said my dear young ladies these men are interested in but one thing. They are searching for a clue to the disappearances that have occurred in this lane. As they will not find this in your cellar, nothing else that they may see there will remain in their minds for a moment. Lucetta said no more. Even her indomitable spirit was giving way before the inevitable discovery that threatened them. Do not let William know were the low words with which she passed hannah but from the short glimpse i caught of william's burly figure standing in the stable door under the guardianship of two detectives i felt this injunction to be quite superfluous william evidently did know i was not going to descend the cellar stairs but the girls made me we want you with us lorine declared in no ordinary tones while lucetta paused and would not go on till i followed this surprised me i no longer seemed to have any clue to their motives but i was glad to be one of the party hannah under lorine's orders had furnished one of the men with a lighted lantern and upon our descent into the dark labyrinth below it became his duty to lead the way which he did with due circumspection what all this underground space into which we were thus introduced had ever been used for it would be difficult to tell at present it was mostly empty after passing a small collection of stores a wine cellar the very door of which was unhinged and lay across the cellar bottom we struck into a hollow void in which there was nothing worth an instant's investigation save the earth under our feet this the two foremost detectives examined very carefully 
detaining us often longer i thought than mr gryce desired or lucetta had patience for but nothing was said in protest nor did the older detective give an order or manifest any special interest in the investigation till he saw the men in front stoop and throw out of the way a coil of rope when he immediately hurried forward and called upon the party to stop the girls who were on either side of me crossed glances at this command and lucetta who had been tottering for the last few minutes fell upon her knees and hid her face in the hollow of her two hands loreen came around and stood by her and i do not know which of them presented the most striking picture of despair the shrinking lucetta or loreen with her quivering form uplifted to meet the shafts of fate without a droop of her eyelids or a murmur from her lips the light of the one lantern which intentionally or unintentionally was concentrated on this pathetic group made it stand out from the midst of the surrounding darkness in a way to draw the gaze of mr gryce upon them he looked and his own brow became overcast evidently we were not far from the cause of their fears ordering the candle lifted he surveyed the ceiling above at which loreen's lips opened slightly in secret dread and amazement then he commanded the men to move on slowly while he himself looked overhead rather than underneath which seemed to astonish his associates who evidently had heard nothing of the hole which had been cut in the floor of the flower parlour suddenly i heard a slight gasp from lucetta who had not moved forward with the rest of us then her rushing figure flew by us and took up its stand by mr gryce who had himself paused and was pointing with an imperious forefinger to the ground under his feet you will dig here said he not heeding her though i am sure he was as well acquainted with her proximity as we dig repeated loreen in what we all saw was a final effort to stave off disgrace and misery my duty demands it said he someone else has been digging here within a very few days miss knollys that is as evident as is the fact that a communication has been made with this place through an opening into the room above see and taking the lantern from the man at his side he held it up toward the ceiling there was no hole there now but there were ample evidences of there having been one and that within a very short time loreen made no further attempt to stay him the house is at your disposal she reiterated but i do not think she knew what she said the man with the bundle in his arms was already unrolling it on the cellar bottom a spade came to light together with some other tools lifting the spade he thrust it smartly into the ground toward which mr gryce's inexorable finger still pointed at the sight and the sound it made a thrill passed through lucetta which made her another creature dashing forward she flung herself down upon the spot with lifted head and outstretched arms stop your desecrating hand she cried this is a grave the grave sirs of our mother end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Investigation. The shock of these words, if false, most horrible; if true, still more horrible, threw us all aback and made even Mister Grice's features assume an aspect quite uncommon to them your mother's grave said he looking from her to loreen with very evident doubt i thought your mother died seven or more years ago and this grave has been dug within three days i know 
she whispered. To the world, my mother has been dead many, many years, but not to us. We closed her eyes night before last, and it was to preserve this secret, which involves others affecting our family honour, that we resorted to expedients which have perhaps attracted the notice of the police and drawn this humiliation down upon us. I can conceive no other reason for this visit, ushered in as it was by Mr. Trome. Miss Lucetta, Mr. Grice spoke quickly. If he had not, I certainly could not have restrained some expression of the emotions awakened in my own breast by this astounding revelation. Miss Lucetta, it is not necessary to bring Mr. Trome's name into this matter, or that of any other person than myself. I saw the coffin lowered here, which you say contained the body of your mother. Thinking this a strange place of burial, and not knowing it was your mother to whom you were paying these last dutiful rites, I took advantage of my position as detective to satisfy myself that nothing wrong lay behind so mysterious a death and burial. Can you blame me, miss? Would I have been a man to trust if I had let such an event as this go by unchallenged? She did not answer. She had heard but one sentence of all this long speech. You saw my mother's coffin lowered. Where were you that you should see that? In some of these dark passages, let in by I know not what traitor to our peace of mind. And her eyes, which seemed to have grown almost supernaturally large and bright under her emotions, turned slowly in their sockets till they rested with something like doubtful accusation upon mine. But not to remain there, for Mr. Grice recalled them almost instantly by this short, sharp negative. No, I was nearer than that. I lent my strength to this burial. If you had thought to look under Mother Jane's hood, you would have seen what would have forced these explanations then and there. And you... I was Mother Jane for the nonce, not from choice, miss, but from necessity. I was impersonating the old woman when your brother came to the cottage. I could not give away my plans by refusing the task your brother offered me. It is well. Lucetta had risen and was now standing by the side of Laureen. Such a secret as ours defies concealment. Even Providence takes part against us. What you want to know, we must tell. But I assure you it has nothing to do with the business you profess to be chiefly interested in. Nothing at all. Then perhaps you and your sister will retire, said he. Distracted as you are by family griefs, I would not wish to add one iota to your distress. This lady, whom you seem to regard with more or less favour as friend or relative, will stay to see that no dishonour is paid to your mother's remains. But your mother's face we must see, Miss Lucetta, if only to lighten the explanations you will doubtless feel called upon to make. It was Lorene who answered this. If it must be, said she, remember your own mother and deal reverently with ours. Which entreaty and the way it was uttered gave me my first distinct conviction that these girls were speaking the truth and that the diminutive body we had come to unearth was that of Althea Knollys, whose fairy-like form I had so long supposed commingled with foreign soil. The thought was almost too much for my self-possession and I advanced upon Lorene with a dozen burning questions on my lips when the voice of Mr. Grice stopped me. "'Explanations later,' said he. "'For the present, we want you here. "'It was no easy task for me to linger there "'with all my doubts unsolved, "'waiting for the decisive moment "'when Mr. Grice should say, "'Come, look, is it she?' "'But the will that had already sustained me "'through so many trying experiences "'did not fail me now.' 
and grievous as was the ordeal i passed steadily through it being able to say though not without some emotion i own it is althea knollys changed almost beyond conception but still these girls mother which was a happier end to this adventure than that we had first feared mysterious as the event was not only to myself but as i could see to the acute detective as well the girls had withdrawn long before this just as mr gryce had desired and i now expected to be allowed to join them but mr gryce detained me till the grave was refilled and made decent again when he turned and to my intense astonishment for i had thought the matter was all over and the exoneration of this household complete said softly and with telling emphasis in my ear our work is not done yet they who make graves so readily in cellars must have been more or less accustomed to the work we have still some digging to do end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain strategy i was overwhelmed what said i you still doubt i always doubt he gravely replied this cellar bottom offers a wide field for speculation too wide perhaps but then i have a plan here he leaned over and whispered a few concise sentences into my ear in a tone so low i should feel that i was betraying his confidence in repeating them but their import will soon become apparent from what presently occurred light miss butterworth to the stairway mr gryce now commanded one of the men and thus accompanied i found my way back to the kitchen where hannah was bemoaning uncomforted the shame which had come upon the house i did not stop to soothe her that was not my cue nor would it have answered my purpose on the contrary i broke into angry ejaculations as i passed her what a shame those wretches cannot be got away from the cellar what do you suppose they expect to find there i left them poking hither and thither in a way that will be very irritating to miss knollys when she finds it out i wonder william stands it what she said in reply i do not know i was half way down the hall before my own words were finished my next move was to go to my room and take from my trunk a tiny hammer and some very small sharp pointed tacks curious articles you will think for a woman to carry on her travels but i am a woman of experience and have known only too often what it was to want these petty conveniences and not be able to get them they were to serve me an odd turn now taking a half dozen tacks in one hand and concealing the hammer in my bag i started boldly for william's room i knew that the girls were not there for i had heard them talking together in the sitting-room as i came up besides if they were i had a ready answer for any demand they might make searching out his boots i turned them over and into the sole of each i drove one of my small tacks then i put them back in the same place and position in which i found them task number one was accomplished when i issued from the room i went as quickly as i could below i was now ready for a talk with the girls whom i found as i had anticipated talking and weeping together in the sitting-room they rose as i came in awaiting my first words in evident anxiety they had not heard me go upstairs i immediately allowed my anxiety and profound interest in this matter to have full play my poor girls what is the meaning of this your mother just dead and the matter kept from me her friend 
it is astounding incomprehensible i do not know what to make of it or of you it has a strange look loreen gravely admitted but we had reasons for this deception miss butterworth our mother charming and sweet as you remember her has not always done right or what you will better understand she committed a criminal act against a person in this town the penalty of which is state's prison with difficulty the words came out with difficulty she kept down the flush of shame which threatened to overwhelm her and did overwhelm her more sensitive sister but her self-control was great and she went bravely on while i in faint imitation of her courage restrained my own surprise and intolerable sense of shock and bitter sorrow under a guise of simple sympathy it was forgery she explained this has never before passed our lips though a cherished wife and a beloved mother she longed for many things my father could not give her and in an evil hour she imitated the name of a rich man here and took the check thus signed to new york the fraud was not detected and she received the money but ultimately the rich man whose money she had spent discovered the use she had made of his name and if she had not escaped would have had her arrested but she left the country and the only revenge he took was to swear that if she ever set foot again in x he would call the police down upon her yes if she were dying and they had to drag her from the brink of the grave and he would have done it and knowing this we have lived under the shadow of this fear for eleven years my father died under it and my mother ah she spent all the remaining years of her life under foreign skies but when she felt the hand of death upon her her affection for her own flesh and blood triumphed over her discretion and she came secretly i own but still with that horror menacing her to these doors and begging our forgiveness lay down under the roof where we were born and died with the halo of our love about her ah said i thinking of all that had happened since i had come into this house and finding nothing but confirmation of what she was saying i begin to understand but lucetta shook her head no said she you cannot understand yet we who had worn mourning for her because my father wished to make this very return impossible knew nothing of what was in store for us till a letter came saying she would be at the c station on the very night we received it to acknowledge our deception to seek and bring her home openly to this house could not be thought of for a moment how then could we satisfy her dying wishes without compromising her memory and ourselves perhaps you have guessed miss butterworth you have had time since we revealed the unhappy secret of this household yes said i i have guessed lucetta with her hand laid on mine looked wistfully into my face don't blame us she cried our mother's good name is everything to us and we knew no other way to preserve it than by making use of the one superstition of this place alas our efforts were in vain the phantom coach brought our mother safely to us but the circumstances which led to our doors being opened to outsiders rendered it impossible for us to carry out our plans unsuspected her grave has been discovered and desecrated and we she stopped choked loreen took advantage of her silence to pursue the explanations she seemed to think necessary it was simsbury who undertook to bring our dying mother from c station to our door he has a crafty spirit under his meek ways and dressed himself in a way to lend colour to the superstition he hoped to awaken william who did not dare to accompany him for fear of arousing gossip 
was at the gate when the coach drove in. It was he who lifted our mother out, and it was while she still clung to him, with her face pressed close to his breast, that we saw her first. Ah, what a pitiable sight it was! She was so wan, so feeble, and yet so radiantly happy. She looked up at Lucetta, and her face grew wonderful in its unearthly beauty. She was not the mother we remembered, but a mother whose life had culminated in the one desire to see and clasp her children again. When she could tear her eyes away from Lucetta, she looked at me, and then the tears came, and we all wept together, even William. And thus, weeping and murmuring words of welcome and cheer, we carried her upstairs and laid her in the great front chamber. Alas, we did not foresee what would happen the very next morning. I mean the arrival of your telegram, to be followed so soon by yourself. Poor girls, poor girls. It was all I could say. I was completely overwhelmed. The first night after your arrival, we moved her into William's room as being more remote and thus a safer refuge for her. The next night she died. The dream which you had of being locked in your room was no dream. Lucetta did that in foolish precaution against your trying to search us out in the night. It would have been better if we had taken you into our confidence. Yes, I assented, that would have been better. But I did not say how much better. That would have been giving away my secret. Lucetta had now recovered sufficiently to go on with the story. William, who is naturally colder than we, and less sensitive in regard to our mother's good name, has shown some little impatience at the restraint imposed upon him by her presence, and this was an extra burden, Miss Butterworth. But that and all the others we have been forced to bear. The generous girl did not speak of her own special grief and loss, have all been rendered useless by the unhappy chance which has brought into our midst this agent of the police. Ah, if I only knew whether this was the providence of God rebuking us for years of deception, or just the malice of man seeking to rob us of our one best treasure, a mother's untarnished name. Mr. Grice acts from no malice, I began, but I saw they were not listening. Have they finished down below? asked Lucetta. Does the man you call Grice seem satisfied? asked Lorene. I drew myself up, physically and mentally. My second task was about to begin. I do not understand those men, said I. They seem to want to look farther than the sacred spot where we left them. If they are going through a form, they are doing it very thoroughly. That is their duty, observed Lorene but Lucetta took it less calmly. It is an unhappy day for us, cried she. Shame after shame, disgrace upon disgrace. I wish we had all died in our childhood. Lorene, I must see William. He will be doing some foolish thing, swearing or... My dear, let me go to William, I urgently put in. He may not like me overmuch, but I will at least prove a restraint to him. You are too feeble. See, you ought to be lying on the couch instead of trying to drag yourself out to the stables. And indeed, at that moment, Lucetta's strength gave suddenly out, and she sank into Lorene's arms, insensible. When she was restored, I hurried away to the stables, still in pursuit of the task which I had not yet completed. I found William sitting doggedly on a stool in the open doorway, grunting out short sentences to the two men who lounged in his vicinity on either side. He was angry, but not as angry as I had seen him many times before. The men were townsfolk and listened eagerly to his broken sentences. One or two of these reached my ears. Let em go it. It won't be now or today they'll settle this business. 
it's the devil's work and devils are sly my house won't give up that secret or any other house they'll be likely to visit the place i would ransack but loreen would say i was babbling goodness knows a fellow's got to talk about something when his fellow townsfolk come to see him and here his laugh broke in harsh cruel and insulting i felt it did him no good and made haste to show myself immediately his whole appearance changed he was so astonished to see me there that for a moment he was absolutely silent then he broke out again into another loud guffaw but this time in a different tone why it's miss butterworth he laughed here saracen come pay your respects to the lady who likes you so well and saracen came but i did not forsake my ground i had espied in one corner just what i had hoped to see there and saracen's presence afforded me the opportunity of indulging in one or two rather curious antics i am not afraid of the dog i declared with marked loftiness shrinking toward the pail of water i had already marked with my eye not at all afraid i continued catching up the pail and putting it before me as the dog made a wild rush in my direction these gentlemen will not see me hurt and though they all laughed they would have been fools if they had not and the dog jumped the pail and i jumped not a pail but a broom handle that was lying amid all the rest of the disorder on the floor they did not see that i had succeeded in doing what i wished which was to place that pail so near to william's feet that but wait a moment everything in its own time i escaped the dog and next moment had my eye on him he did not move after that which rather put a stop to the laughter which observing i drew very near to william and with a sly gesture to the two men which for some reason they seemed to understand whispered in the rude fellow's ear they found your mother's grave under the flower parlour your sisters told me to tell you but that is not all their trampling hither and yon through all the secret places in the cellar turning up the earth with their spades i know they won't find anything but we thought you ought to know here i made a feint of being startled and ceased my second task was done the third only remained fortunately at that moment mr gryce and his followers showed themselves in the garden they had just come from the cellar and played their part in the same spirit i had mine though they were too far off for their words to be heard the air of secrecy they maintained and the dubious looks they cast towards the stable could not but evince even to william's dull understanding that their investigations had resulted in a doubt which left them far from satisfied but once this impression made they did not linger long together the man with the lantern moved off and mr gryce turned towards us changing his whole appearance as he advanced till no one could look more cheerful and good-humoured well that is over he sighed with a forced air of infinite relief mere form mr knollys mere form we have to go through these pretended investigations at times and good people like yourself have to submit but i assure you it is not pleasant and under the present circumstances i am sure you understand me mr knollys the task has occasioned me a feeling almost of remorse but that is inseparable from a detective's life he is obliged every day of his life to ride over the tenderest emotions forgive me and now boys scatter till i call you together again i hope our next search will be without such sorrowful accompaniments it succeeded william stared at him and stared at the men slowly filing off down the yard but was not for a moment deceived by these overflowing expressions on the contrary he looked more concerned than he had while seated between the two men manifestly set to guard him the deuce he cried 
with a shrug of his shoulders that expressed anything but satisfaction. Lucetta always said, but even he knew enough not to finish that sentence, low as he had mumbled it. Watching him, and watching Mr. Grice, who at that moment turned to follow his men, I thought the time had come for action. Making another spring, as if in fresh terror of Saracen, who, by the way, was eyeing me with the meekness of a lamb, I tipped over that pail with such suddenness and with such dexterity that its whole contents poured in one flood over William's feet. My third task was accomplished. The oath he uttered and the excuses which I volubly poured forth could not have reached Mr. Grice's ears, for he did not return. And yet, from the way his shoulders shook as he disappeared around the corner of the house, I judged that he was not entirely ignorant of the subterfuge by which I hoped to force this blundering booby of ours to change the boots he wore for one of the pairs into which I had driven those little tacks. End of chapter 31「Relief The plan succeeded. Mr. Grice's plans usually do. William went immediately to his room, and in a little while came down and hastened into the cellar. "'I want to see what mischief they have done,' said he. When he came back, his face was beaming. All right, he shouted to his sisters, who had come into the hall to meet him. Your secret's out, but mine. There, there, interposed Loreen. You had better go upstairs and prepare for supper. We must eat, William, or rather Miss Butterworth must eat, whatever our sorrows or disappointments. He took the rebuke with a grunt and relieved us of his company. Little did he think, as he went whistling up the stairs, that he had just shown Mr. Grice where to search for whatever might be lying under the broad sweep of that cellar bottom. That night, it was after supper which I did not eat for all my natural stoicism, Hannah came rushing in where we all sat silent, for the girls showed no disposition to enlarge their confidences in regard to their mother, and no other topic seemed possible and, closing the door behind her, said quickly and with evident chagrin, "'Those men are here again. They say they forgot something. What do you think it means, Miss Lorene? They have spades and lanterns, and they are the police, Hannah. If they forgot something, they have the right to return. Don't work yourself up about that. The secret they have already found out was our worst. There is nothing to fear after that.' and she dismissed Hannah, merely bidding her let us know when the house was quite clear. Was she right? Was there nothing worse for them to fear? I longed to leave these trembling sisters, longed to join the party below and follow in the track of the tiny impressions made by the tacks I had driven into William's souls. If there was anything hidden under the cellar bottom, natural anxiety would carry him to the spot he had most to fear so they would only have to dig at the places where these impressions took a sharp turn but was there anything hidden there from the sisters words and actions i judged there was nothing serious but would they know william was quite capable of deceiving them had he done so it was a question it was solved for us by Mr. Grice's reappearance in the room an hour or so later. From the moment the light fell upon his kindly features, I knew that I might breathe again freely. It was not the face he showed in the house of a criminal, nor did his bow contain any of the false deference with which he sometimes tries to hide his secret doubt or contempt. I have come to trouble you for the last time, ladies. We have made a double search through this house and through the stables, 
and feel perfectly justified in saying that our duty henceforth will lead us elsewhere the secrets we have surprised are your own and if possible shall remain so your brother's propensity for vivisection and the return and death of your mother bear so little on the real question which interests this community that we may be able to prevent their spread as gossip through the town that this may be done conscientiously however i ought to know something more of the latter circumstance if miss butterworth will then be good enough to grant me a few minutes conference with these ladies i may be able to satisfy myself to such an extent as to let this matter rest where it is i rose with right good will a mountain weight had been lifted from me proof positive that i had really come to love these girls what they told him whether it was less or more than they told me i cannot say and for the moment did not know that it had not shaken his faith in them was evident for when he came out to where i was waiting in the hall his aspect was even more encouraging than it had been before no guile in those girls he whispered as he passed me the clue given by what seemed mysterious in this house has come to naught to-morrow we take up another the trinkets found in mother jane's cottage are something real you may sleep soundly to-night miss butterworth your part has been well played but i know you are glad that it has failed and i knew that i was glad too which is the best proof that there is something in me besides the detective instinct the front door had scarcely closed behind him when william came storming in he had been gossiping over the fence with mr trome and had been beguiled into taking a glass of wine in his house this was evident without his speaking of it those sneaks cried he i hear they've been back again digging and stirring up our cellar bottom like mad that's because you're so dreadful shy you girls you're afraid of this you're afraid of that you don't want folks to know that mother wants well well there it is now if you had not tried to keep this wretched secret it would have been an old matter by this time and my affairs would have been left untouched but now every fool will cry out at me in this staid puritanical old town and all because a few bones have been found of animals which have died in the cause of science i say it's all your fault not that i have anything to be ashamed of because i haven't but because this other thing this damned wicked series of disappearances taking place for aught we know a dozen rods from our gates though i think but no matter what i think you all like or say you like old deacon spear has made every one so touchy in this pharisaical town that to kill a fly has become a crime even if it is to save oneself from poison i'm going to see if i cannot make folks blink askance at some other man than me i'm going to find out who or what causes these disappearances this was a declaration to make us all stare and look a little bit foolish william playing the detective well what might i not live to see next but the next moment an overpowering thought struck me might this deacon spear by any chance be the rich man whose animosity althea knollys had awakened end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain book four the birds of the air lucetta the next morning i rose with the lark i had slept well and all my old vigour had returned a new problem was before me a problem of surpassing interest now that the knollys family had been eliminated from the list of persons regarded with suspicion by the police mother jane and the jewels 
were to be Mr. Grice's starting point for future investigation. Should they be mine? My decision on this point halted, and thinking it might be helped by a breath of fresh air, I decided upon an early stroll as a means of settling this momentous question. There was silence in the house when I passed through it on my way to the front door, but that silence had lost its terrors and the old house its absorbing mystery. Yet it was not robbed of its interest. When I realised that Althea Knollys, the Althea of my youth, had just died within its walls, as ignorant of my proximity as I of hers, I felt that no old-time romance, nor any terror brought by flitting ghost or stalking apparition, could compare with the wonder of this return, and the strange and thrilling circumstances which had attended it. And the end was not yet. Peaceful as everything now looked, I still felt that the end had not come. The fact that Saracen was loose in the yard gave me some slight concern as I opened the great front door and looked out. But the control under which I had held him the day before encouraged me in my venture, and after a few words with Hannah, who was careful not to let me slip away unnoticed, I boldly stepped forth and took my solitary way down to the gate. It was not yet eight, and the grass was still heavy with dew. At the gate I paused. I wished to go farther, but Mr. Grice's injunction had been imperative about venturing into the lane alone. Besides, no, that was not a horse's hoof. There could be no one on the road so early as this. I was alarming myself unnecessarily. Yet, well, I held my place, a little awkwardly, perhaps. Self-consciousness is always awkward, and I could not help being a trifle self-conscious at a meeting so unexpected and... But the more I attempt to explain, the more confused my expressions become. So I will just say that, by this very strange chance, I was leaning over the gate when Mr. Trome rode up for the second time and found me there. I did not attempt any excuses. He is gentleman enough to understand that a woman of my temperament rises early and must have the morning air. That he should feel the same necessity is a coincidence, natural perhaps, but still a coincidence, so there was nothing to be said about it. But had there been, I would not have spoken for he seemed so gratified at finding me enjoying nature at this early hour that any words from me would have been quite superfluous. He did not dismount, that would have shown intention, but he stopped and, well, we have both passed the age of romance and what he said cannot be of interest to the general public, especially as it did not deal with the disappearances or with the discoveries made in the Knollys house the day before, or with any of those questions which have absorbed our attention up to this time. That we were engaged more than five minutes in this conversation, I cannot believe. I have always been extremely accurate in regard to time. Yet a good half hour was lost by me that morning, for which I have never been able to account. Perhaps it was spent in the short discussion which terminated our interview, a discussion which may be of interest to you, for it was upon the action of the police. Nothing came of the investigations made by Mr. Grice yesterday, I perceive, Mr. Trome had remarked, with some reluctance, as he gathered up his reins to depart. Well, that is not strange. How could he have hoped to find any clue to such a mystery as he is engaged to unearth in a house presided over by Miss Knollys? How could he indeed? Yet, I added, determined to allay this man's suspicions, which, notwithstanding the openness of his remark, were still observable in his tones. You say that with an air I should hardly expect from so good a neighbour and friend, why is this, Mr. Trome? Surely you do not associate crime with the Mrs. Knollys. Crime? 
oh no certainly not no one could associate crime with the mrs knollys if my tone was at fault it was due perhaps to my embarrassment this meeting your kindness the beauty of the day and the feeling these all call forth well i may be pardoned if my tones are not quite true in discussing other topics my thoughts were with the one i addressed then that tone of doubt was all the more misplaced i retorted i am so frank i cannot bear innuendo in others besides mr trome the worst folly of this home was laid bare yesterday in a way to set at rest all darker suspicions you knew that william indulged in vivisection well that is bad but it cannot be called criminal let us do him justice then and for his sister's sake see how we can re-establish him in the good graces of the community but mr trome who for all our short acquaintance was not without a very decided appreciation for certain points in my character shook his head and with a smiling air returned you are asking the impossible not only of the community but yourself william can never re-establish himself he is of too rude a make the girls may recover the esteem they seem to have lost but william why if the cause of those disappearances was found to-day and found at the remotest end of this road or even up in the mountains where no one seems to have looked for it william would still be known throughout the county as a rough and cruel man i have tried to stand his friend but it's been against odds miss butterworth even his sisters recognize this and show their lack of confidence in our friendship but i would like to oblige you i knew he ought to go i knew that if he had simply lingered the five minutes which common courtesy allowed that curious eyes would be looking from loreen's window and that at any minute i might expect some interference from lucetta who had read through this man's forbearance toward william the very natural distrust he could not but feel toward so uncertain a character yet with such an opportunity at my command how could i let him go without another question mr trome said i you have the kindest heart and the closest lips but have you ever thought that deacon spear he stopped me with a really horrified look deacon spear's house was thoroughly examined yesterday said he as mine will be to-day don't insinuate anything against him leave that for foolish william then with the most charming return to his old manner for i felt myself in a measure rebuked he lifted his hat and urged his horse forward but having withdrawn himself a step or two he paused and with the slightest gesture toward the little hut he was facing added in a much lower tone than any he had yet used besides deacon spear is much too far away from mother jane's cottage don't you remember that i told you she never could be got to go more than forty rods from her own doorstep and breaking into a quick canter he rode away i was left to think over his words and the impossibility of my picking up any other clue than that given me by mr gryce i was turning toward the house when i heard a slight noise at my feet looking down i encountered the eyes of saracen he was crouching at my side and as i turned toward him his tail actually wagged it was a sight to call the colour up to my cheek not that i blushed at this sign of goodwill astonishing as it was considering my feeling toward dogs but at his being there at all without my knowing it so palpable a proof that no woman i make no exceptions can listen more than one minute to the expressions of a man's sincere admiration without losing a little of her watchfulness was not to be disregarded by one as inexorable to her own mistakes as to those of others 
I saw myself the victim of vanity, and while somewhat abashed by the discovery, I could not but realise that this solitary proof of feminine weakness was not really to be deplored in one who has not yet passed the line beyond which any such display is ridiculous. Lucetta met me at the door, just as I had expected her to. Giving me a short look, she spoke eagerly, but with a latent anxiety, for which I was more or less prepared. "'I am glad to see you looking so bright this morning,' she declared. "'We are all feeling better now that the incubus of secrecy is removed. "'But,' here she hesitated, "'I would not like to think you told Mr. Trome what happened to us yesterday.' "'Lucetta,' said I, "'there may be women of my age who delight in gossiping about family affairs with comparative strangers.' but I am not that kind of woman. Mr. Trome, friendly as he has proved himself, and worthy as he undoubtedly is of your confidence and trust, will have to learn from some other person than myself anything which you may wish to have withheld from him. For reply, she gave me an impulsive kiss. I thought I could trust you, she cried. Then, with a dubious look, half daring half shrinking she added when you come to know and like us better you will not care so much to talk to neighbours they never can understand us or do us justice mr trome especially this was a remark i could not let pass why i demanded why do you think Mr. Trome cherishes such animosity towards you? Has he ever... But Lucetta could exercise a repellent dignity when she chose. I did not finish my sentence, though I must have looked the inquiry I thought better not to put into words. Mr. Trome is a man of blameless reputation, she avowed. If he has allowed himself to cherish suspicions in our regard, he has doubtless had his reasons for it. And with these quiet words, she left me to my thoughts, and I must say to my doubts, which were all the more painful that I saw no immediate opportunity for clearing them up. Late in the afternoon, William burst in with news from the other end of the lane. Such a lark, he cried. The investigation at Deacon Spears' house was a mere farce, and I just made them repeat it with a few frills. They had dug up my cellar, and I was determined they should dig up his. Oh, the fun it was! The old fellow kicked, but I had my way. They couldn't refuse me, you know. I hadn't refused them. So that man's cellar bottom has had a stir up. They didn't find anything, but it did me a lot of good and that's something. I do hate Deacon Spear. Couldn't hate him worse if he'd killed and buried ten men under his hearthstone. There is no harm in Deacon Spear, said Lucetta quickly. Did they submit Mr. Trome's house to a search also? asked Laureen, ashamed of William's heat and anxious to avert any further display of it. Yes, they went through that too. I was with them. Glad I was too. I say, girls, I could have laughed to see all the comforts that old bachelor has about him. Never saw such fixings. Why, that house is as neat and pretty from top to bottom as any old maid's. It's silly, of course, for a man, and I'd rather live in an old rookery like this, where I can walk from room to room in muddy boots if I want to, and train my dogs and live in freedom like the man I am. Yet I couldn't help thinking it mighty comfortable, too, for an old fellow like him who likes such things and don't have chick or child to meddle why he had pin cushions on all his bureaus and they had pins in them the laugh with which he delivered this last sentence might have been heard a quarter of a mile away lucetta looked at loreen and loreen looked at me but none of us joined in the mirth which seemed to me very ill-timed Suddenly, Lucetta asked, Did they dig up Mr. Trome's cellar? 
William stopped laughing long enough to say, "'His cellar? Why, it's cemented as hard as an oak floor. No, they didn't polish their spades in his house, which was another source of satisfaction to me. Deacon Spear hasn't even that to comfort him. Oh, how I did enjoy that old fellow's face when they began to root up his old fungi!' Lucetta turned away with a certain odd constraint I could not but notice. "'It's a humiliating day for the lane,' said she. "'And what is worse,' she suddenly added, "'nothing will ever come of it. "'It will take more than a band of police to reach the root of this matter.' I thought her manner odd, and moving towards her, took her by the hand with something of a relative's familiarity. "'What makes you say that? "'Mr. Grice seems a very capable man.' "'Yes, yes, but capability has nothing to do with it. "'Chance might, and pluck might, "'but wit and experience not. "'Otherwise the mystery would have been settled long ago. "'I wish I... well?' "'Her hand was trembling violently. "'Nothing.' I don't know why I have allowed myself to talk on this subject. Lorene and I once made a compact never to give any opinion upon it. You see how I have kept it. She had drawn her hand away and suddenly had become quite composed. I turned my attention toward Lorene, but she was looking out of the window and showed no intention of further pursuing the conversation. William had strolled out. Well, said I, if ever a girl had reason for breaking such a compact, you are certainly that girl. I could never have been as silent as you have been. That is, if I had any suspicions on so serious a subject. Why, your own good name is impugned, yours and that of every other person living in this lane. Miss Butterworth, she replied, I have gone too far. Besides, you have misunderstood me. I have no more knowledge than anybody else as to the source of these terrible tragedies. I only know that an almost superhuman cunning lies at the bottom of so many unaccountable disappearances, a cunning so great that only a crazy person. Ah, I murmured eagerly, Mother Jane. She did not answer. Instantly I took a resolution. Lucetta, said I, is Deacon Spear a rich man? Starting violently, she looked at me amazed. If he is, I should like to hazard the guess that he is the man who has held you in such thraldom for years. And if he were, said she, I could understand William's antipathy to him, and also his suspicions. She gave me a strange look. Then, without answering, walked over and took Lorene by the hand. Hush, I thought I heard her whisper. At all events, the two sisters were silent for more than a moment. Then Lucetta said, Deacon Spear is well off, but nothing will ever make me accuse living man of crimes so dreadful. And she walked away, drawing Lorene after her. In another moment she was out of the room leaving me in a state of great excitement. This girl holds the secret to the whole situation, I inwardly decided. The belief that nothing more can be learned from her is a false one. I must see Mr. Grice. William's rhodomontades are so much empty air, but Lucetta's silence has a meaning we cannot afford to ignore. So impressed was I by this, that I took the first opportunity which presented itself of seeing the detective. This was early the next morning. He and several of the townspeople had made their appearance at Mother Jane's cottage with spades and picks, and the sight had naturally drawn us all down to the gate, where we stood watching operations in a silence which would have been considered unnatural by anyone who did not realise the conflicting nature of the emotions underlying it. William, to whom the death of his mother seemed to be a great deliverance, had been inclined to be more or less jocular, 
but his sallies meeting with no response he had sauntered away to have it out with his dogs leaving me alone with the two girls and hannah the latter seemed to be absorbed entirely by the aspect of mother jane who stood upon her doorstep in an attitude so menacing that it was little short of tragic her hood for the first time in the memory of those present had fallen away from her head revealing a wealth of grey hair which flew away from her head like a weird halo her features we could not distinguish but the emotion which inspired her breathed in every gesture of her uplifted arms and swaying body it was wrath personified and yet an unreasoning wrath one could see she was as much dazed as outraged her lares and penates were being attacked and she had come from the heart of her solitude to defend them i declare hannah protested it is pitiful she has nothing in the world but that garden and now they are going to root that up do you think that the sight of a little money would appease her i inquired anxious for an excuse to drop a word into the ear of mr gryce perhaps said hannah she dearly loves money but it will not take away her fright it will if she has nothing to be frightened about said i and turning to the girls i asked them somewhat mincingly for me if they thought i would make myself conspicuous if i crossed the road on this errand and when loreen answered that that would not deter her if she had the money and lucetta added that the sight of such misery was too painful for any mere personal consideration i took advantage of their complaisance and hastily made my way over to the group who were debating as to the point they would attack first gentlemen said i good morning i am here on an errand of mercy poor old mother jane is half imbecile and does not understand why you invade her premises with these implements will you object if i endeavour to distract her mind with a little piece of gold i happen to have in my pocket she may not deserve it but it will make your task easier and save us some possible concern half of the men at once took off their hats the other half nudged each other's elbows and whispered and grimaced like the fools they were the first half were gentlemen though not all of them wore gentlemen's clothes it was mr gryce who spoke certainly madam give the old woman anything you please but and here he stepped up to me and began to whisper you have something to say what is it i answered in the same quick way the mine you thought exhausted has possibilities in it yet question lucetta it may prove a more fruitful task than turning up this soil the bow he made was more for the onlookers than for the suggestion i had given him yet he was not ungrateful for the latter as i who was beginning to understand him could see be as generous as you please he cried aloud we would not disturb the old crone if it were not for one of her well-known follies nothing will take her over forty rods away from her home now what lies within those forty rods these men think we ought to see the shrug i gave answered both the apparent and the concealed question satisfied that he would understand it so I hurried away from him and approached Mother Jane. See, said I, astonished at the regularity of her features, now that I had a good opportunity of observing them. I have brought you money. Let them dig up your turnips if they will. She did not seem to perceive me. Her eyes were wild with dismay and her lips trembling with a passion far beyond my power to comfort lizzie she cried lizzie she will come back and find no home oh my poor girl my poor poor girl it was pitiable i could not doubt her anguish or her sincerity 
the delirium of a broken heart cannot be simulated and this heart was not controlled by reason that was equally apparent immediately my heart which goes out slowly but none the less truly on that account was touched by something more than the surface sympathy of the moment she may have stolen she may have done worse she may even have been at the bottom of the horrible crimes which have given its name to the lane we were in but her acts if acts they were were the result of a clouded mind fixed for ever upon the fancied needs of another and not the expression of personal turpitude or even of personal longing or avarice therefore i could pity her and i did making another appeal i pressed the coin hard into one of her hands till the contact effected what my words had been unable to do and she finally looked down and saw what she was clutching then indeed her aspect changed and in a few minutes of slowly growing comprehension she became so quiet and absorbed that she forgot to look at the men and even forgot me who was probably nothing more than a flitting shadow to her a silk gown she murmured it will buy lizzie a silk gown oh where did it come from the good good gold the beautiful gold such a little piece yet enough to make her look fine my lizzie my pretty pretty lizzie no numbers this time the gift was too overpowering for her even to remember that it must be hidden away i walked away while her delight was still voluble somehow it eased my mind to have done her this little act of kindness and i think it eased the minds of the men too at all events every hat was off when i repassed them on my way back to the knollis gateway i had left both the girls there but i found only one awaiting me lucetta had gone in and so had hannah on what errand i was soon to know what do you suppose that detective wants of lucetta now asked Lorene, as i took my station again at her side while you were talking to mother jane he stepped over here and with a word or two induced lucetta to walk away with him toward the house see there they are in those thick shrubs near the right wing he seems to be pleading with her do you think i ought to join them and find out what he is urging upon her so earnestly i don't like to seem intrusive but lucetta is easily agitated you know and his business cannot be of an indifferent nature after all he has discovered concerning our affairs no i agreed and yet i think lucetta will be strong enough to sustain the conversation judging from the very erect attitude she is holding now perhaps he thinks she can tell him where to dig they seem a little at sea over there and living as you do a few rods from mother jane he may imagine that lucetta can direct him where to first plant the spade it's an insult Lorene protested all these talks and visits are insults to be sure this detective has some excuse but keep your eye on lucetta i interrupted she is shaking her head and looking very positive she will prove to him it is an insult we need not interfere i think but Lorene had grown pensive and did not heed my suggestion a look that was almost wistful had supplanted the expression of indignant revolt with which she had addressed me and when next moment the two we had been watching turned and came slowly toward us it was with decided energy she bounded forward and joined them what is the matter now she asked what does mr gryce want lucetta mr gryce himself spoke i simply want her said he to assist me with a clue from her inmost thoughts when i was in your house he explained with a praiseworthy consideration for me and my relations to these girls for which i cannot be too grateful 
I saw in this young lady something which convinced me that, as a dweller in this lane, she was not without her suspicions as to the secret cause of the fatal mysteries which I have been sent here to clear up. Today I have frankly accused her of this and asked her to confide in me. But she refuses to do so, Miss Loreen. Yet her face shows even at this moment that my old eyes were not at fault in my reading of her. She does suspect somebody, and it is not Mother Jane. How can you say that? began Lucetta. But the eyes which Loreen that moment turned upon her seemed to trouble her, for she did not attempt to say any more, only looked equally obstinate and distressed. If Lucetta suspects any one, Loreen now steadily remarked, then I think she ought to tell you who it is. You do. Then perhaps you, commenced Mr. Grice, can persuade her as to her duty, he finished, as he saw her head rise in protest of what he evidently had intended to demand. Lucetta will not yield to persuasion, was her quiet reply. Nothing short of conviction will move the sweetest natured, but the most determined of all my mother's children. What she thinks is right, she will do. I will not attempt to influence her. Mr. Grice, with one comprehensive survey of the two, hesitated no longer. I saw the rising of the blood into his forehead, which always precedes the beginning of one of his great moves, and, filled with a sudden excitement, I awaited his next words as a tyro awaits the first unfolding of the plan he has seen working in the brain of some famous strategist. Miss Lucetta, his very tone was changed, changed in a way to make us all start, notwithstanding the preparation his momentary silence had given us. I have been thus pressing and perhaps rude in my appeal, because of something which has come to my knowledge, which cannot but make you, of all persons, extremely anxious as to the meaning of this terrible mystery. I am an old man, and you will not mind my bluntness. I have been told, and your agitation convinces me there is truth in the report, that you have a lover, a Mr. Ostrander. Ah! She had sunk as if crushed by one overwhelming blow to the earth. The eyes, the lips, the whole pitiful face that was upturned to us, remain in my memory to-day as the most terrible and yet the most moving spectacle that has come into my by no means uneventful life. What has happened to him? Quick, quick, tell me. For answer, Mr. Grice drew out a telegram. From the master of the ship on which he was to sail, he explained. It asks if Mr. Ostrander left this town on Tuesday last, as no news has been received of him. Loreen, Loreen, when he left us he passed down that way, shrieked the girl, rising like a spirit and pointing east toward Deacon Spears. He is gone, he is lost, but his fate shall not remain a mystery. I will dare its solution. I, I, tonight you will hear from me again. And without another glance at any of us, she turned and fled toward the house. End of chapter 33「Conditions」Conditions But in another moment she was back, her eyes dilated and her whole person exhaling a terrible purpose. "'Do not look at me, do not notice me,' she cried. 
but in a voice so hoarse no one but mr gryce could fully understand her i am for no one's eyes but god's pray that he may have mercy upon me then as she saw us all instinctively fall back she controlled herself and pointing toward mother jane's cottage said more distinctly as for those men let them dig let them dig the whole day long secrecy must be kept a secrecy so absolute that not even the birds of the air must see that our thoughts range beyond the forty rods surrounding mother jane's cottage she turned and would have fled away for the second time but mr gryce stopped her you have set yourself a task beyond your strength can you perform it i can perform it she said if loreen does not talk and i am allowed to spend the day in solitude i had never seen mr gryce so agitated no not when he left olive randolph's bedside after an hour of vain pleading but to wait all day is it necessary for you to wait all day it is necessary she spoke like an automaton to-night at twilight when the sun is setting meet me at the great tree just where the road turns not a minute sooner not an hour later i will be calmer then and waiting now for nothing not for a word from loreen nor a detaining touch from mr gryce she flew away for the second time this time loreen followed her well that is the hardest thing i ever had to do said mr gryce wiping his forehead and speaking in a tone of real grief and anxiety do you think her delicate frame can stand it will she survive this day and carry through whatever it is she has set herself to accomplish she has no organic disease said i but she loved that young man very much and the day will be a terrible one to her mr gryce sighed i wish i had not been obliged to resort to such means said he but women like that only work under excitement and she does know the secret of this affair do you mean i demanded almost aghast that you have deceived her with a false telegram that that slip of paper you hold read it he cried holding it out toward me i did read it alas there was no deception in it it read as he said however i began but he had pocketed the telegram and was several steps away before i had finished my sentence i am going to start these men up said he you will breathe no word to miss lucetta of my sympathy nor let your own interests slack in the investigations which are going on under our noses and with a quick sharp bow he made his way to the gate whither i followed him in time to see him set his foot upon a patch of sage you will begin at this place he cried and work east and gentlemen something tells me that we shall be successful with almost a simultaneous sound a dozen spades and picks struck the ground the digging up of mother jane's garden had begun in earnest End of chapter 34。chapter 35 of lost man's lane by anna catherine green。this librivox recording is in the public domain。the dove。i remained at the gate。i had been bidden to show my interest in what was going on in mother jane's garden。and this was the way i did it。but my thoughts were not with the diggers. I knew as well then as later that they would find nothing worth the trouble they were taking, and having made up my mind to this, I was free to follow the lead of my own thoughts. They were not happy ones. I was neither satisfied with myself nor with the prospect of the long day of cruel suspense that awaited us. When I undertook to come to X, it was with the latent expectation of making myself useful in ferreting out its mystery and how had i succeeded 
I had been the means through which one of its secrets had been discovered, but not the secret. And while Mr. Grice was good enough or wise enough to show no diminution in his respect for me, I knew that I had sunk a peg in his estimation from the consciousness I had of having sunk two, if not three, pegs in my own. This was a galling thought to me, but it was not the only one which disturbed me. Happily or unhappily, I have as much heart as pride, and Lucetta's despair and the desperate resolve to which it had led had made an impression upon me which I could not shake off. Whether she knew the criminal or only suspected him, whether in the heat of her sudden anguish she had promised more or less than she could perform, the fact remained that we, by whom I mean first and above all Mr. Grice, the ablest detective on the New York force, and myself, who, if no detective, am at least a factor of more or less importance in an inquiry like this, were awaiting the action of a weak and suffering girl to discover what our own experience should be able to obtain for us unassisted. That Mr. Grice felt that he was playing a great card in thus enlisting her despair in our service did not comfort me. I am not fond of games in which real hearts take the place of painted ones, and besides, I was not ready to acknowledge that my own capacity for ferreting out this mystery was quite exhausted, or that I ought to remain idle while Lucetta bent under a task so much beyond her strength. So deeply was I impressed by this latter consideration that I found myself, even in the midst of my apparent interest in what was going on at Mother Jane's cottage, asking if I was bound to accept the defeat pronounced upon my efforts by Mr. Grice, and if there was not yet time to retrieve myself and save Lucetta. One happy thought, or clever linking of cause to effect, might lead me yet to the clue which we had hitherto sought in vain. And then who would have more right to triumph than Amelia Butterworth? or who more reason to apologise than Ebenezer Grice. But where was I to get my happy thought, and by what stroke of fortune could I reasonably hope to light upon a clue which had escaped the penetrating eye of my quondam colleague? Lucetta's gesture and Lucetta's exclamation, he passed that way, indicated that her suspicions pointed in the direction of Deacon Spear's cottage. So did William's wandering accusations, but this was little help to me, confined as I was to the Knollys domain, both by Mr. Grice's command and by my own sense of propriety. No, I must light on something more tangible, something practical enough to justify me in my own eyes for any interference I might meditate. In short, I must start from a fact and not from a suspicion. But what fact? Why, there was but one, and that was the finding of certain indisputable tokens of crime in Mother Jane's keeping. That was a clue, a clue to be sure, which Mr. Grice, while ostensibly following it in his present action, really felt to lead nowhere, but which I, here my thoughts paused, I dare not promise myself too satisfactory results to my efforts, even while conscious of that vague elation which presages success, and which I could only overcome by resorting again to reasoning. This time I started with a question. Had Mother Jane committed these crimes herself? I did not think so. Neither did Mr. Grice for all the persistence he showed in having the ground about her humble dwelling-place turned over. Then how had the ring of Mr. Chittenden come to be in her possession, when, as all agreed, she never was known to wander more than forty rods away from home? If the crime by which this young gentleman had perished had taken place up the road, 
as Lucetta's denouncing finger plainly indicated, then this token of Mother Jane's complicity in it had been carried across the intervening space by other means than Mother Jane herself. In other words, it was brought to her by the perpetrator, or it was placed where she could lay hand on it, neither supposition implying guilt on her part, she being in all probability as innocent of wrong as she was of sense. At all events, such should be my theory for the nonce, old theories having exploded or become of little avail in the present aspect of things. To discover, then, the source of crime, I must discover the means by which this ring reached Mother Jane. An almost hopeless task, but not to be despaired of on that account. Had I not wrung the truth in times gone by from that piece of obstinate stolidity, the Van Burnham scrubwoman, and if I could do this, might I not hope to win an equal confidence from this half-demented creature, with a heart so passionate it beat to but one tune, her Lizzie? I meant at least to try, and, under the impulse of this resolve, I left my position at the gate and recrossed the road to Mother Jane, whose figure I could dimly discern on the farther side of her little house. Mr. Grice barely looked up as I passed him, and the men not at all. They were deep in their work, and probably did not see me. Neither did Mother Jane at first. She had not yet wearied of the shining gold she held, though she had begun again upon that chanting of numbers, the secret of which Mr. Grice had discovered in his investigation of her house. I therefore found it hard to make her hear me when I attempted to speak. She had fixed upon the new number fifteen, and seemed never to tire of repeating it. At last I took cue from her speech, and shouted out the word, TEN. It was the number of the vegetable in which Mr. Chittenden's ring had been hidden, and it made her start violently. TEN, TEN, I reiterated, catching her eye. He who brought it has carried it away. Come into the house and look. It was a desperate attempt. I felt myself quake inwardly as I realised how near Mr. Grice was standing and what his anger would be if he surprised me at this move after he had cried, Halt! But neither my own perturbation nor the thought of his possible anger could restrain the spirit of investigation which had returned to me with the above words and when I saw that they had not fallen upon deaf ears, but that Mother Jane heard and in a measure understood them, I led the way into the hut and pointed to the string from which the one precious vegetable had been torn. She gave a spring toward it that was well-nigh maniacal in its fury, and for an instant I thought she was going to rend the air with one of her wild yells when there came a swishing of wings at one of the open windows, and a dove flew in and nestled in her breast, diverting her attention so that she dropped the empty husk of the onion she had just grasped, and seized the bird in its stead. It was a violent clutch, so violent that the poor dove panted and struggled under it till its head flopped over, and I looked to see it die in her hands. Stop, I cried, horrified at a sight I was so unprepared to expect from one who was supposed to cherish these birds most tenderly. But she heard me no more than she saw the gesture of indignant appeal I made her. All her attention, as well as all her fury, was fixed upon the dove, over whose neck and under whose wings she ran her trembling fingers with the desperation of one looking for something he failed to find. Ten, ten, it was now her turn to shout as her eyes passed in angry menace from the bird to the empty husk that dangled over her head. You brought it, did you, and you've taken it, have you? There, then, you'll never bring or carry any more. 
and lifting up her hand she flung the bird to the other side of the room and would have turned upon me in which contingency i would for once have met my match if in releasing the bird from her hands she had not at the same time released the coin which she had hitherto managed to hold through all her passionate gestures the sight of this piece of gold which she had evidently forgotten for the moment turned her thoughts back to the joys it promised her recapturing it once more she sank again into her old ecstasy upon which i proceeded to pick up the poor senseless dove and leave the hut with a devout feeling of gratitude for my undoubted escape that i did this quietly and with the dove hidden under my little cape no one who knows me well will doubt i had brought something from the hut besides this victim of the old imbecile's fury and i was no more willing that mr gryce should see the one than detect the other i had brought away a clue the birds of the air shall carry it so the scripture runs this bird this pigeon who now lay panting out his life in my arms had brought her the ring which in mr gryce's eyes had seemed to connect her with the disappearance of young mr chittenden end of chapter thirty five Chapter thirty six of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An hour of startling experiences. Not till I was safely back in the Knollys grounds, not indeed till I had put one or two large and healthy shrubs between me and a certain pair of very prying eyes did i bring the dove out from under my cape and examine the poor bird for any sign which might be of help to me in the search to which i was newly committed but i found nothing and was obliged to resort to my old plan of reasoning to make anything out of the situation in which i thus so unexpectedly found myself the dove had brought the ring into old mother jane's hands but whence and through whose agency this was as much a secret as before but the longer i contemplated it the more i realized that it need not remain a secret long that we had simply to watch the other doves note where they lighted and in whose barn doors they were welcome for us to draw inferences that might lead to revelations before the day was out if deacon spear but deacon spear's house had been examined as well as that of every other resident in the lane this i knew but it had not been examined by me and unwilling as i was to challenge the accuracy or thoroughness of a search led on by such a man as mr gryce i could not but feel that with such a hint as i had received from the episode in the hut it would be a great relief to my mind to submit these same premises to my own somewhat penetrating survey no man in my judgment having the same quickness of eyesight in matters domestic as a woman trained to know every inch of a house and to measure by a hair's breadth every fall of drapery within it but how in the name of goodness was i to obtain an opportunity for this survey had we not one and all been bidden to confine our attention to what was going on in mother jane's cottage and would it not be treason to lucetta to run the least risk of awakening apprehension in any possibly guilty mind at the other end of the road yes but for all that i could not keep still if fate or my own ingenuity offered me the least chance of pursuing the clue i had wrung from our imbecile neighbour at the risk of my life it was not in my nature to do so any more than it was in my nature to yield up my present advantage to mr gryce without making a personal effort to utilise it 
I forgot that I failed in this once before in my career, or rather I recalled this failure, perhaps, and felt the great need of retrieving myself. When, therefore, in my slow stroll towards the house, I encountered William in the shrubbery, I could not forbear accosting him with a question or two. William, I remarked, gently rubbing the side of my nose with an irresolute forefinger, and looking at him from under my lids. That was a scurvy trick you played Deacon Spear yesterday. He stood amazed, then burst into one of his loud laughs. You think so, he cried. Well, I don't. He only got what he deserved, the hard, sanctimonious sneak. Do you say that, I inquired, with some spirit, because you dislike the man, or because you really believe him to be worthy of hatred? William's amusement at this argued little for my hopes. We are very much interested in the deacon, he suggested with a leer, which insolence I allowed to pass unnoticed, because it best suited my plan. You have not answered my question, I remarked, with a forced air of anxiety. Oh, no, he cried, so I haven't. And he tried to look serious, too. Well, well, to be just, I have nothing really against the man but his mean ways. Still, if I were going to risk my life on a hazard as to who is the evil spirit of this lane, I should say spear and done with it. He has such cursed small eyes. I don't think his eyes are too small, I returned loftily. Then, with a sudden change of manner, I suggested anxiously, And my opinion is shared by your sisters. They evidently think very well of him. Oh, he sneered, girls are no judges. They don't know a good man when they see him, and they don't know a bad. You mustn't go by what they say. I had it on the tip of my tongue to ask if he did not think Lucetta sufficiently understood herself to be trusted in what she contemplated doing that night. But this was neither in accordance with my plan, nor did it seem quite loyal to Lucetta, who, so far as I knew, had not communicated her intentions to this booby brother. I therefore changed this question into a repetition of my first remark. Well, I still think the trick you played Deacon Spear yesterday a poor one, and I advise you, as a gentleman, to go and ask his pardon. This was such a preposterous proposition, he could not hold his peace. I ask his pardon, he snorted. Well, Saracen, did you ever hear the like of that? I ask Deacon Spear's pardon, for obliging him to be treated with as great attention as I had been myself. If you do not, I went on, unmoved, I shall go and do it myself. I think that is what my friendship for you warrants. I am determined that while I am a visitor in your house, no one shall be able to pick a flaw in your conduct. He stared, as he might well do, tried to read my face, then my intentions, and failing to do both, which was not strange, broke into noisy mirth. Oh, ho, he laughed. So that is your game, is it? Well, I never. Saracen, Miss Butterworth wants to reform me, wants to make one of her sleek city chaps out of William Knollys. She'll have hard work of it, won't she? But then we're beginning to like her well enough to let her try. Miss Butterworth, I'll go with you to Deacon Spear. I haven't had so much chance for fun in a twelve-month. I had not expected such success, and was duly thankful, but I made no reference to it aloud. On the contrary, I took his complacence as a matter of course, and hiding all token of triumph, suggested quietly that we should make as little ado as possible over our errand, seeing that Mr. Grice was something of a meddler, and might take it into his head to interfere. Which suggestion had all the effect I anticipated, for, at the double prospect of amusing himself at the deacon's expense, 
and of outwitting the man whose business it was to outwit us he became not only willing but eager to undertake the adventure offered him so with the understanding that i was to be ready to drive into town as soon as he could hitch up the horse we parted on the most amicable terms he proceeding towards the stable and i towards the house where i hoped to learn something new about lucetta but loreen from whom alone i could hope to glean any information was shut in her room and did not come out though i called her more than once which if it left my curiosity unsatisfied at least allowed me to quit the house without awakening hers william was waiting for me at the gate when i descended he was in the best of humours and helped me into the buggy he had resurrected from some corner of the old stable with a grimace of suppressed mirth which argued well for the peace of our proposed drive the horse's head was turned away from the quarter we were bound for but as we were ostensibly on our way to the village this showed but common prudence on william's part and as such met with my entire approbation mr gryce and his men were hard at work when we passed them knowing the detective so well and rating at its full value his undoubted talent for reading the motives of those about him i made no attempt at cajolery in the explanation i proffered of our sudden departure but merely said in my old peremptory way that i found waiting at the gate so tedious that i had accepted william's invitation to drive into town which while it astonished the old gentleman did not really arouse his suspicions as a more conciliatory manner and speech might have done this disposed of we drove rapidly away william's sense of humour once aroused was not easily allayed he seemed so pleased with his errand that he could talk of nothing else and turned the subject over and over in his clumsy way till i began to wonder if he had seen through the object of our proposed visit and was making me the butt of his none too brilliant wit but no he was really amused at the part he was called upon to play and once convinced of this i let his humour run on without check till we had re-entered lost man's lane from the other end and were in sight of the low sloping roof of deacon spear's old-fashioned farmhouse then i thought it time to speak william said i deacon spear is too good a man and as i take it is in possession of too great worldly advantages for you to be at enmity with him remember that he is a neighbour and that you are a landed proprietor in this lane good for you was the elegant reply with which this young boar honoured me i didn't think you had such an eye for the main chance deacon spear is rich is he not i pursued with an ulterior motive he was far from suspecting rich why i don't know that depends upon what you city ladies call rich i shouldn't call him so but then as you say i am a landed proprietor myself his laugh was boisterously loud and as we were then nearly in front of the deacon's house it rang in through the open windows causing such surprise that more than one head bobbed up from within to see who dared to laugh like that in lost man's lane while i noted these heads and various other small matters about the house and place william tied up the horse and held out his hand for me to descend i begin to suspect he whispered as he helped me out why you are so anxious to have me on good terms with the deacon at which insinuation i attempted to smile but only succeeded in forcing a grim twitch or two to my lips for at that moment and before i could take one step towards the house a couple of pigeons rose up from behind the house and flew away in a bee-line for mother jane's cottage ha thought i my instinct has not failed me behold the link between this house and the hut in which those tokens of crime were found 
and was for the moment so overwhelmed by this confirmation of my secret suspicions that i quite forgot to advance and stood stupidly staring after these birds now rapidly disappearing in the distance william's voice aroused me come he cried don't be bashful i don't think much of deacon spear myself but if you do why what's the matter now he asked with a startled look at me i had clutched him by the arm nothing i protested only you see that window over there the one in the gable of the barn i mean i thought i saw a hand thrust out a white hand that dropped crumbs have they a child on this place no replied william in an odd voice and with an odd look toward the window i have mentioned did you really see a hand there i most certainly did i answered with an air of indifference i was far from feeling some one is up in the hayloft perhaps it is deacon spear himself if so he will have to come down for now that we are here i am determined you shall do your duty deacon spear can't climb that hayloft was the perplexed answer i received in a hardly intelligible mutter i've been there and i know only a boy or a very agile young man could crawl along the beams that lead to that window it is the one hiding place in this part of the lane and when i said yesterday that if i were the police and had the same search to make which they have i knew where i would look i meant that same little platform up behind the hay whose only outlook is yonder window but i forgot that you have no suspicions of our good deacon that you are here on quite a different errand than to search for silly rufus so come along and but i resisted his impelling hand he was so much in earnest and so evidently under the excitement of what appeared to him a great discovery that he seemed quite another man this made my own suspicions less hazardous and also added to the situation fresh difficulties which could only be met by an appearance on my part of perfect ingenuousness turning back to the buggy as if i had forgotten something and thus accounting to any one who might be watching us for the delay we showed in entering the house i said to william you have reasons for thinking this man a villain or you wouldn't be so ready to suspect him now what if i should tell you that i agree with you and that this is why i have dragged you here this fine morning i should say you were a deuced smart woman was his ready answer but what can you do here what have we already done i asked discovered that they have someone in hiding in what you call an inaccessible place in the barn but didn't the police examine the whole place yesterday they certainly told me they had searched the premises thoroughly yes he repeated with great disdain they said and they said but they didn't climb up to the one hiding place in sight that old fellow grice declared it wasn't worth their while that only birds could reach that loophole oh i returned somewhat taken aback you called his attention to it then to which william answered with a vigorous nod and the grumbling words i don't believe in the police i think they're often in league with the very rogues they but here the necessity of approaching the house became too apparent for further delay deacon spear had shown himself at the front door and the sight of his astonished face twisted into a grimace of doubtful welcome drove every other thought away than how we were to acquit ourselves in the coming interview seeing that william was more or less nonplussed by the situation i caught him by the arm and whispering let us keep to our first programme led him up the walk with much the air of a triumphant captain bringing in a recalcitrant prisoner my introduction under these circumstances can be imagined by those who have followed william's awkward ways but the deacon who was probably the most surprised if not the most disconcerted member of the group possessed a natural fund of conceit and self-complacency that prevented any outward manifestation of his feelings 
though I could not help detecting a carefully suppressed antagonism in his eye when he allowed it to fall upon William, which warned me to exercise my full arts in the manipulation of the matter before me. I accordingly spoke first, and with all the prim courtesy such a man might naturally expect from an intruder of my sex and appearance. "'Deacon Spear,' said I, as soon as we were seated in his stiff, old-fashioned parlour, "'you are astonished to see us here, no doubt, "'especially after the display of animosity shown towards you yesterday "'by this graceless young friend of mine. "'But it is on account of this unfortunate occurrence that we are here. "'After a little reflection, and a few hints, I may add, from one who has seen more of life than himself, William felt that he had cause to be ashamed of himself for his show of sport in yesterday's proceedings, and accordingly he has come in my company to tender his apologies and entreat your forbearance. Am I not right, William? The fellow is a clown under all and every circumstance, and serious as our real purpose was, and dreadful as was the suspicion he professed to cherish against the suave and seemingly respectable member of the community we were addressing, he could not help laughing, as he blunderingly replied, "'That you are, Miss Butterworth. She's always right, Deacon. I did act like a fool yesterday.' And seeming to think that, with this one sentence, he had played his part out to perfection, he jumped up and strolled out of the house, almost pushing down, as he did so, the two daughters of the house, who had crept into the hall from the sitting-room to listen. "'Well, well!' exclaimed the deacon. "'You have done wonders, Miss Butterworth, to bring him to even so small an acknowledgment as that. He's a vicious one, is William Knollys, and if I were not such a lover of peace and concord, he should not long be the only aggressive one. But I have no taste for strife, and so you may both regard his apology as accepted. But why do you rise, madam? Sit down, I pray, and let me do the honours. Martha? Jemima? But I would not allow him to summon his daughters. The man inspired me with too much dislike, if not fear. Besides, I was anxious about William. What was he doing, and of what blunder might he not be guilty without my judicious guidance? I am obliged to you, I returned, but I cannot wait to meet your daughters now. Another time, Deacon. There is important business going on at the other end of the lane, and William's presence there may be required. Ah, he observed, following me to the door. They are digging up Mother Jane's garden. I nodded, restraining myself with difficulty. Fool's work, he muttered. Then, with a curious look, which made me instinctively draw back, he added, These things must inconvenience you, madam. I wish you had made your visit to the lane in happier times. There was a smirk on his face, which made him positively repellent. I could scarcely bow my acknowledgments. His look and attitude made the interview so obnoxious. Looking about for William, I stepped down from the stoop. The deacon followed me. Where is William? I asked. The deacon ran his eye over the place and suddenly frowned with ill-concealed vexation. The scapegrace, he murmured. What business has he in my barn? I immediately forced a smile, which, in days long past, I've almost forgotten them now, used to do some execution. Oh, he's a boy, I exclaimed. Do not mind his pranks, I pray. What a comfortable place you have here. Instantly a change passed over the deacon, and he turned to me with an air of great interest, broken now and then by an uneasy glance behind him at the barn. I am glad you like the place, he insinuated, keeping close at my side as I stepped somewhat briskly down the walk. It is a nice place, worthy of the commendation of so competent a judge as yourself. It was a barren, hard-worked farm without one attractive feature. 
I have lived on it now forty years, thirty-two of them with my beloved wife Caroline, and two... Here he stopped and wiped a tear from the driest eye I ever saw. Miss Butterworth, I am a widower. I hastened my steps. I hear duly and with the strictest regard for the truth aver that I decidedly hastened my steps at this very unnecessary announcement. But he, with another covert glance behind him towards the barn, from which, to my surprise and increasing anxiety, William had not yet emerged, kept well up to me, and only paused when I paused at the side of the road near the buggy. Miss Butterworth, he began, undeterred by the air of dignity I assumed, I have been thinking that your visit here is a rebuke to my unneighbourliness, but the business which has occupied the lane these last few days has put us all into such a state of unpleasantness that it was useless to attempt sociability. His voice was so smooth, his eyes so small and twinkling, that if I could have thought of anything except William's possible discoveries in the barn, I should have taken delight in measuring my wits against his egotism. But as it was, I said nothing, possibly because I only half heard what he was saying. I am no ladies' man, these were the next words I heard, but then I judge you're not anxious for flattery, but prefer the square thing uttered by a square man, without delay or circumlocution. Madam, I am fifty-three, and I have been a widower two years. I am not fitted for a solitary life, and I am fitted for the companionship of an affectionate wife who will keep my hearth clean and my affections in good working order. Will you be that wife? You see my home. Here his eye stole behind him with that uneasy look towards the barn which William's presence in it certainly warranted. A home which I can offer you unencumbered if you... Desire to live in Lost Man's Lane, I put in subduing both my surprise and my disgust at this preposterous proposal in order to throw all the sarcasm of which i was capable into this single sentence oh he exclaimed you don't like the neighbourhood well we could go elsewhere i am not set against the city myself astounded at his presumption regarding him as a possible criminal who was endeavouring to beguile me for purposes of his own, I could no longer repress either my indignation or the wrath with which such impromptu addresses naturally inspired me. Cutting him short with a gesture which made him open his small eyes, I exclaimed in continuation of his remark, Nor, as I take it, are you set against the comfortable little income somebody has told you I possessed? I see your disinterestedness, Deacon, but I should be sorry to profit by it. Why, man, I never spoke to you before in my life, and do you think... Oh, he suavely insinuated, with a suppressed chuckle which even his increasing uneasiness as to William could not altogether repress... I see you are not above the flattery that pleases other women. Well, madam, I know a tremendous fine woman when I see her, and from the moment I saw you riding by the other day, I made up my mind I would have you for the second Mrs. Spear, if persistence and a proper advocacy of my cause could accomplish it. Madam, I was going to visit you with this proposal tonight. But seeing you here, the temptation was too great for my discretion, and so I have addressed you on the spot. But you need not answer me at once. I don't need to know any more about you than what I can take in with my two eyes. But if you would like a little more acquaintance with me, why, I can wait a couple of weeks till we've rubbed the edges off our strangeness, when, when you think I will be so charmed with Deacon Spear, that I will be ready to settle down with him in Lost Man's Lane, or if that will not do, carry him off to Gramercy Park, 
where he will be the admiration of all new york and brooklyn to boot why man if i was so easily satisfied as that i would not be in a position to-day for you to honour me with this proposal i am not easy to suit so i advise you to turn your attention to some one much more anxious to be married than i am but and here i allowed some of my real feelings to appear if you value your own reputation or the happiness of the lady you propose to inveigle into a union with you do not venture too far in the matrimonial way till the mystery is dispelled which shrouds lost man's lane in horror if you were an honest man you would ask no one to share your fortunes whilst the least doubt rests upon your reputation my reputation he had started very visibly at these words madam be careful i admire you but no offence said i for a stranger i have been perhaps unduly frank i only mean that any one who lives in this lane must feel himself more or less enveloped by the shadow which rests upon it when that is lifted each and every one of you will feel himself a man again from indications to be seen in the lane to-day that time may not be far distant mother jane is a likely source for the mysteries that agitate us she knows just enough to have no proper idea of the value of a human life the deacon's retort was instantaneous madam said he with a snap of his fingers i have not that much interest in what is going on down there if men have been killed in this lane which i do not believe old mother jane has had no hand in it my opinion is and you may value it or not just as you please that what the people hereabout call crimes are so many coincidences which some day or other will receive their due explanation every one who has disappeared in this vicinity has disappeared naturally no one has been killed that is my theory and you will find it correct on this point i have expended more than a little thought i was irate i was also dumbfounded at his audacity did he think i was the woman to be deceived by any such balder dash as that but i shut my lips tightly lest i should say something and he not finding this agreeable being no conversationalist himself drew himself up with a pompously expressed hope that he would see me again after his reputation was cleared when his attention as well as my own was diverted by seeing william's slouching figure appear in the barn door and make slowly towards us instantly the deacon forgot me in his interest in william's approach which was so slow as to be tantalizing to us both when he was within speaking distance deacon spear started towards him well he cried one would think you had gone back a dozen or so years and were again robbing your neighbour's hen roosts been in the hay eh he added leaning forward and plucking a wisp or two from my companion's clothes well what did you find there in trembling fear for what the lout might answer i put my hand on the buggy rail and struggled anxiously to my seat william stepped forward and loosened the horse before speaking then with a leer he dived into his pocket and remarking slowly i found this brought to light a small riding whip which we both recognized as one he often carried i flung it up in the hay yesterday in one of my fits of laughing so just thought i would bring it down to-day you know it isn't the first time i've climbed about those rafters deacon as you have been good enough to insinuate the deacon evidently taken aback eyed the young fellow with a leer in which i saw something more serious than mere suspicion was that all he began but evidently thought better than to finish whilst william with a nonchalance that surprised me blunderingly avoided his eye and bounding into the buggy beside me started up the horse and drove slowly off ta-da deacon he called back 
If you want to see fun, come up to our end of the lane. There's precious little here. And thus, with a laugh, terminated an interview which, all things considered, was the most exciting, as well as the most humiliating, I have ever taken part in. William, I began, but stopped. The two pigeons, whose departure I had watched a little while before, were coming back, and as I spoke, fluttered up to the window before mentioned, where they alighted and began picking up the crumbs which I had seen scattered for them. See, I suddenly exclaimed, pointing them out to William, was I mistaken when I thought I saw a hand drop crumbs from that window? The answer was a very grave one for him. No, said he, for I have seen more than a hand through the loophole I made in the hay. I saw a man's leg stretched out as if he were lying on the floor with his head toward the window. It was but a glimpse I got, but the leg moved as I looked at it, and so I know that someone lies hid in that little nook up under the roof. Now it isn't any one belonging to the lane, for I know where every one of us is or ought to be at this blessed moment. And it isn't a detective, for I heard a sound like heavy sobbing as I crouched there. Then who is it? Silly Rufus, I say. And if that hay was all lifted, we would see sights that would make us ashamed of the apologies we uttered to the old sneak just now. I want to get home, said I. Drive fast. Your sisters ought to know this. The girls, he cried. Yes, it will be a triumph over them. They never would believe I had an atom of judgment. But we'll show them if William Knollys is altogether a fool. We were now near to Mr. Trome's hospitable gateway. Coming from the excitements of my late interview, it was a relief to perceive the genial owner of this beautiful place wandering among his vines and testing the condition of his fruit by a careful touch here and there. As he heard our wheels, he turned, and seeing who we were, threw up his hands in ill-restrained pleasure and came buoyantly forward. There was nothing to do but to stop, so we stopped. Why, William, why, Miss Butterworth, what a pleasure! such was his amiable greeting i thought you were all busy at your end of the lane but i see you have just come from town had an errand there i suppose yes william grumbled eyeing the luscious pear mr trome held in his hand the look drew a smile from that gentleman admiring the first fruits he observed well it is a handsome specimen he admitted handing it to me with his own peculiar grace I beg you will take it, Miss Butterworth. You look tired. Pardon me if I mention it. He is the only person I know who detects any signs of suffering or fatigue on my part. I am worried by the mysteries of this lane, I ventured to remark. I hate to see Mother Jane's garden uprooted. Ah, he acquiesced with much evidence of good feeling. It is a distressing thing to witness. I wish she might have been spared. William, there are other pears on the tree this came from. Tie up the horse, I pray, and gather a dozen or so of these for your sisters. They will never be in better condition for plucking than they are today. William, whose mouth and eyes were both watering for a taste of the fine fruit thus offered, moved with alacrity to obey this invitation, while I, more startled than pleased, or rather as much startled as pleased by the prospect of a momentary tete-a-tete -tete with our agreeable neighbour sat uneasily eyeing the luscious fruit in my hand and wishing i was ten years younger that the blush i felt slowly stealing up my cheek might seem more appropriate to the occasion but mr trome appeared not to share my wish he was evidently so satisfied with me as I was that he found it difficult to speak at first, and when he did, but, tut tut, you have no desire to hear any such confidences as these, I am sure. A middle-aged gentleman's expressions of admiration for a middle-aged lady may savour of romance to her, 
but hardly to the rest of the world so i will pass this conversation by with the single admission that it ended in a question to which i felt obliged to return a reluctant no mr trome was just recovering from the disappointment of this when william sauntered back with his hands and pockets full ah that graceless scamp chuckled with a suspicious look at our downcast faces been improving the opportunity eh mr trome who had fallen back against his old well curb surveyed his young neighbour for the first time with a look of anger but it vanished almost as quickly as it appeared and he contented himself with a low bow in which i read real grief this was too much for me and i was about to open my lips with a kind phrase or two when a flutter took place over our heads and the two pigeons whose flight i had watched more than once during the last hour flew down and settled upon mr trome's arms and shoulders oh i exclaimed with a sudden shrinking that i hardly understood myself and though i covered up the exclamation with as brisk a good-bye as my inward perturbation would allow that sight and the involuntary ejaculation i had uttered were all i saw or heard during our hasty drive homeward End of chapter 36chapter thirty seven of lost man's lane by anna katherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain i astonish mr gryce and he astonishes me but as we approached the group of curious people which now filled up the whole highway in front of mother jane's cottage i broke from the nightmare into which this last discovery had thrown me and turning to william said with a resolute air you and your sisters are not of one mind regarding these disappearances you ascribe them to deacon spear but they whom do they ascribe them to i shouldn't think it would take a woman of your wit to answer that question the rebuke was deserved i had wit but i had refused to exercise it my blind partiality for a man of pleasing exterior and magnetic address had prevented the cool play of my usual judgment due to the occasion and the trust which had been imposed in me by mr gryce resolved that this should end no matter at what cost to my feelings i quietly said you allude to mr trome that is the name he carelessly assented girls you know let their prejudices run away with them an old grudge yes i tentatively put in he persecuted your mother and so they think him capable of any wickedness the growl which william gave was not one of dissent but i don't care what they think said he looking down at the heap of fruit which lay between us i'm trome's friend and don't believe one word they choose to insinuate against him what if he didn't like what my mother did we didn't like it either and william i calmly remarked if your sisters knew that silly rufus had been found in deacon spear's barn they would no longer do mr trome this injustice no that would settle them that would give me a triumph which would last long after this matter was out of the way very well then said i i am going to bring about this triumph i am going to tell mr gryce at once what we have discovered in deacon spear's barn and without waiting for his ah yes or no i jumped from the buggy and made my way to the detective's side his welcome was somewhat unexpected ah fresh news he exclaimed i see it in your eye what have you chanced upon madam in your disinterested drive into town i thought i had eliminated all expression from my face and that my words would bring a certain surprise with them 
but it is useless to try to surprise mr gryce you read me like a book said i i have something to add to the situation mr gryce i have just come from the other end of the lane where i found a clue which may shorten the suspense of this weary day and possibly save lucetta from the painful task she has undertaken in our interests mr chittenden's ring i paused for the exclamation of encouragement he is accustomed to give on such occasions and while i paused prepared for my accustomed triumph he did not fail me in the exclamation nor did i miss my expected triumph was not found by mother jane or even brought to her in any ordinary way or by any ordinary messenger it came to her on a pigeon's neck the pigeon you will find lying dead among the bushes in the knollis yard he was amazed he controlled himself but he was very visibly amazed his exclamations proved it madam miss butterworth this ring mr chittenden's ring whose presence in her hut we thought an evidence of guilt was brought to her by one of her pigeons so she told me i aroused her fury by showing her the empty husk in which it had been concealed in her rage at its loss she revealed the fact i have just mentioned it is a curious one sir and one i am a little proud to have discovered curious it is more than curious it is bizarre and will rank i am safe in prophesying as one of the most remarkable facts that have ever adorned the annals of the police madam when i say i envy you the honour of its discovery you will appreciate my estimate of it and you but when did you find this out and what explanation are you able to give of the presence of this ring on a pigeon's neck sir to your first question i need only reply that i was here two hours or so ago and to the second that everything points to the fact that the ring was attached to the bird by the victim himself as an appeal for succour to whoever might be fortunate enough to find it unhappily it fell into the wrong hands that is the ill luck which often befalls prisoners prisoners yes cannot you imagine a person shut up in an inaccessible place making some such attempt to communicate with his fellow creatures but what inaccessible place have we in wait said i you have been in deacon spear's barn certainly many times but the answer glib as it was showed shock i began to gather courage well said i there is a hiding place in that barn which i dare declare you have not penetrated do you think so madam a little loft way up under the eaves which can only be reached by clambering over the rafters didn't deacon spear tell you there was such a place no but william then i inexorably pursued he says he pointed such a spot out to you and that you pooh-poohed at it as inaccessible and not worth the searching william is a madam i beg your pardon but william has just wit enough to make trouble but there is such a place there i urged and what is more there is someone hidden in it now i saw him myself you saw him saw a part of him in short saw his hand he was engaged in scattering crumbs for the pigeons that does not look like starvation smiled mr gryce with the first hint of sarcasm he had allowed himself to make use of in this interview no said i but the time may not have come to inflict this penalty on silly rufus he has been there but a few days and well what have i said now nothing ma'am nothing but what made you think the hand you saw belonged to silly rufus because he was the last person to disappear from this lane the last 
what am i saying he wasn't the last lucetta's lover was the last mr gryce could that hand have belonged to mr ostrander i was intensely excited so much so that mr gryce made me a warning gesture hush he whispered you are attracting attention that hand was the hand of mr ostrander and the reason why i did not accept william knollys's suggestion to search the deacon's barn loft was because i knew it had been chosen as a place of refuge by this missing lover of lucetta end of chapter thirty seven chapter thirty eight of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain a few words never have keener or more conflicting emotions been awakened in my breast than by these simple words but alive to the necessity of hiding my feelings from those about me i gave no token of my surprise but rather turned a stonier face than common upon the man who had caused it refuge i repeated he is there then of his own free will or yours i sarcastically added not being able to quite keep down this reproach as i remembered the deception practised upon lucetta mr ostrander madam has been spending the week with deacon spear they are old friends you know that he should spend it quietly and to a degree in hiding was as much his plan as mine for while he found it impossible to leave lucetta in the doubtful position in which she and her family at present stand he did not wish to aggravate her misery by the thought that he was thus jeopardizing the position on which all his hopes of future advancement depended he preferred to watch and wait in secret seeing which i did what i could to further his wishes his usual lodging was with the family but when the search was instituted i suggested that he should remove himself to that eyrie back of the hay where you were sharp enough to detect him to-day don't attempt any of your flatteries upon me i protested they will not make me forget that i have not been treated fairly and lucetta oh may i not tell lucetta and spoil our entire prospect of solving this mystery no madam you may not tell lucetta when fate has put such a card into our hands as i played with that telegram to-day we would be flying in the face of providence not to profit by it lucetta's despair makes her bold upon that boldness we depend to discover and bring to justice a great criminal i felt myself turn pale for that very reason perhaps i assumed a still sterner air and composedly said if mr ostrander is in hiding at the deacon's and he and his host are both in your confidence then the only man whom you can designate in your thoughts by this dreadful title must be mr trome i had perhaps hoped he would recoil at this or give some other evidence of his amazement at an assumption which to me seemed preposterous but he did not and i saw with what feelings may be imagined that this conclusion which was half bravado with me had been accepted by him long enough for no emotion to follow its utterance oh i exclaimed how can you reconcile such a suspicion with the attitude you have always preserved towards mr trome madam said he do not criticise my attitude without taking into account existing appearances they are undoubtedly in mr trome's favour i am glad to hear you say so said i i am glad to hear you say so why it was in response to his appeal that you came to x at all mr gryce's smile conveyed a reproach which i could not but acknowledge i amply merited 
had he spent evening after evening at my house entertaining me with tales of the devices and the many inconsistencies of criminals to be met now by such a puerile disclaimer as this but beyond that smile he said nothing on the contrary he continued as if i had not spoken at all but appearances he declared will not stand before the insight of a girl like lucetta she has marked the man as guilty and we will give her the opportunity of proving the correctness of her instinct but mr trome's house has been searched and you have found nothing nothing i argued somewhat feebly that is the reason we find ourselves forced to yield our judgment to lucetta's intuitions was his quick reply and smiling upon me with his blandest air he obligingly added miss butterworth is a woman of too much character not to abide the event with all her accustomed composure and with this final suggestion i was as yet too crushed to resent he dismissed me to an afternoon of unparalleled suspense and many contradictory emotions End of chapter 38「When, in the course of events, the current of my thoughts receive a decided check, and I find myself forced to change former conclusions, or habituate myself to new ideas and a fresh standpoint, I do it as I do everything else, with determination and a total disregard of my own previous predilections. Before the afternoon was well over, I was ready for any revelations which might follow Lucetta's contemplated action, merely reserving a vague hope that my judgment would yet be found superior to her instinct. At five o'clock the diggers began to go home nothing had been found under the soil of mother jane's garden and the excitement of search which had animated them early in the day had given place to a dull resentment mainly directed towards the knollis family if one could judge of these men's feelings by the heavy scowls and significant gestures with which they passed our broken-down gateway by six the last man had filed by leaving Mr. Grice free for the work which lay before him. I had retired long before this to my room, where I awaited the hour set by Lucetta with a feverish impatience quite new to me. As none of us could eat, the supper-table had not been laid, and though I had no means of knowing what was in store for us, the sombre silence and oppression under which the whole house lay seemed a portent that was by no means encouraging suddenly i heard a knock at my door rising hastily i opened it loreen stood before me with parted lips and terror in all her looks come she cried come and see what i have found in lucetta's room then she's gone i cried yes she's gone but come and see what she has left behind her hastening after loreen who was by this time halfway down the hall i soon found myself on the threshold of the room i knew to be lucetta's she made me promise cried loreen halting to look back at me that i would let her go alone and that i would not enter the highway till an hour after her departure but with these evidences of the extent of her dread before us how can we stay in this house and dragging me to a table she showed me lying on its top a folded paper and two letters the folded paper was lucetta's will and the letters were directed severally to loreen and to myself with the injunction that they were not to be read till she had been gone six hours she has prepared herself for death i exclaimed 
shocked to my heart's core but determinedly hiding it but you need not fear any such event is she not accompanied by mr gryce i do not know i do not think so how could she accomplish her task if not alone miss butterworth miss butterworth she has gone to brave mr trome our mother's persecutor and our lifelong enemy thinking hoping believing that in so doing she will rouse his criminal instincts if he has them and so lead to the discovery of his crimes and the means by which he has been enabled to carry them out so long undetected it is noble it is heroic it is martyr-like but oh miss butterworth i have never broken a promise to any one before in all my life but i am going to break the one i made her come let us fly after her she has her lover's memory but i have nothing in all the world but her i immediately turned and hastened down the stairs in a state of humiliation which should have made ample amends for any show of arrogance i may have indulged in in my more fortunate moments Lorene followed me and when we were in the lower hall she gave me a look and said my promise was not to enter the highway would you be afraid to follow me by another road a secret road all overgrown with thistles and blackberry bushes which have not been trimmed up for years i thought of my thin shoes my neat silk dress but only to forget them the next moment i will go anywhere said i but Lorene was already too far in advance of me to answer she was young and lithe and had reached the kitchen before i had passed the flower parlour but when we had sped clear of the house i found that my progress bade fair to be as rapid as hers for her agitation was a hindrance to her while excitement always brings out my powers and heightens both my wits and my judgment our way lay past the stables from which i expected every minute to see two or three dogs jump but william who had been discreetly sent out of the way early in the afternoon had taken saracen with him and possibly the rest so our passing by disturbed nothing not even ourselves the next moment we were in a field of prickers through which we both struggled till we came into a sort of swamp here was bad going but we floundered on edging continually toward a distant fence beyond which rose the symmetrical lines of an orchard mr trome's orchard in which those pleasant fruits grew which bah should i ever be able to get the taste of them out of my mouth at a tiny gateway covered with vines Lorene stopped i do not believe this has been opened for years but it must be opened now and throwing her whole weight against it she burst it through and bidding me pass hastened after me over the trailing branches and made without a word for the winding path we now saw clearly defined on the edge of the orchard before us oh exclaimed Lorene, stopping one moment to catch her breath i do not know what i fear or to what our steps will bring us i only know that i must hunt for lucetta till i find her if there is danger where she is i must share it you can rest here or come farther on i went farther on suddenly we both started a man had sprung up from behind the hedgerow that ran parallel with the fence that surrounded mr trome's place silence he whispered putting his finger on his lips if you are looking for miss knollys he added seeing us both pause aghast she is on the lawn beyond talking to mr trome if you will step here you can see her she is in no kind of danger but if she were mr gryce is in the first row of trees to the back there and a call from me that made me remember my whistle it was still round my neck but my hand which had instinctively gone to it 
fell again in extraordinary emotion as i realized the situation and compared it with that of the morning when blinded by egotism and foolish prejudice in favor of this man i ate of his fruit and hearkened to his outrageous addresses come beckoned Lorine, happily too absorbed in her own emotions to notice mine let us get nearer if mr trome is the wicked man we fear there is no telling what the means are which he uses to get rid of his victims there was nothing to be found in his house but who knows where the danger may lurk and that it may not be near her now it was evidently to dare it she came to offer herself as a martyr that we might know hush i whispered controlling my own fears roused against my will by this display of terror in this usually calmest of natures no danger can menace her where they stand unless he is a common assassin and carries a pistol no pistol murmured the man who had crept again near us pistols make a noise he will not use a pistol good god i whispered you do not share her sister's fears that it is in the heart of this man to kill lucetta five strong men have disappeared hereabout said the fellow never moving his eye from the couple before us why not one weak girl with a cry Lorene started forward run she whispered run but as the word left her lips a slight movement took place in the belt of trees where we had been told mr gryce lay in hiding and we could see him issue for a moment into sight with his finger like that of his man laid warningly on his lips Lorene trembled and drew back seeing which the man beside us pointed to the hedge and whispered softly there is just room between it and the fence for a person to pass sideways if you and this lady want to get nearer to miss knollys you might take that road but mr gryce will expect you to be very quiet the young lady expressly said before she came into this place that she could do nothing if for any reason mr trome should suspect they were not alone we will be quiet i assured him anxious to hide my face which i felt twitch at every mention of mr trome's name Lorene was already behind the hedge the evening was one of those which are made for peace the sun which had set in crimson had left a glow on the branches of the forest which had not yet faded into the grey of twilight the lawn around which we were skirting had not lost the mellow brilliancy which made it sparkle nor had the cluster of varied hued hollyhocks which set their gorgeousness against the neat yellow of the peaceful doorposts shown any dimness in their glory which was on a par with that of the setting sun but though i saw all this it no longer appeared to me desirable lucetta and lucetta's fate the mystery and the impossibility of its being explained out here in the midst of turf and blossoms filled all my thoughts and made me forget my own secret cause for shame and humiliation Lorene, who had wormed her way along till she crouched nearly opposite to the place where her sister stood plucked me by the gown as i approached her and pointing to the hedge which pressed up so close it nearly touched our faces seemed to bid me look through searching for a spot where there was a small opening i put my eye to this and immediately drew back they are moving nearer the gate i signalled to Lorene, at which she crept along a few paces but with a stealth so great that alert as i was i could not hear a twig snap i endeavoured to imitate her but not with as much success as i could wish the sense of horror which had all at once settled upon me the supernatural dread of something which i could not see but which i felt had seized me for the first time 
and made the ruddy sky and the broad stretch of velvet turf with the shadows playing over it of swaying tree-tops and clustered oleanders more thrilling and awesome to me than the dim halls of the haunted house of the knollis family in that midnight hour when i saw a body carried out for burial amid trouble and hush and a mystery so great it would have daunted most spirits for the remainder of their lives the very sweetness of the scene made its horror never have i had such sensations never have i felt so deeply the power of the unseen yet it seemed so impossible that anything could happen here anything which would explain the total disappearance of several persons at different times without a trace of their fate being left to the eye that i could but liken my state to that of nightmare where visions take the place of realities and often overwhelm them i had pressed too close against the hedge as i struggled with these feelings and the sound i made struck me as distinct if not alarming but the tree-tops were rustling overhead and while lucetta might have heard the hedge branches crack her companion gave no evidence of doing so we could distinguish what they were saying now and realizing this we stopped moving and gave our whole attention to listening mr trome was speaking i could hardly believe it was his voice it had so changed in tone nor could i perceive in his features distorted as they now were by every evil passion the once quiet and dignified countenance which had so lately imposed upon me lucetta my little lucetta he was saying so she has come to see me come to taunt me with the loss of her lover whom she says i have robbed her of almost before her eyes i rob her how can i rob her or any one of a man with a voice and arm of his own stronger than mine am i a wizard to dissipate his body in vapour yet can you find it in my house or on my lawn you are a fool lucetta so are all these men about here fools it is in your house hush she cried her slight figure rising till we forgot it was the feeble lucetta we were gazing at no more accusations directed against us it is you who must expect them now mr trome your evil practices are discovered to-morrow you will have the police here in earnest they did but play with you when they were here before you child he gasped striving however to restrain all evidences of shock and terror why who was it called in the police and set them working in lost man's lane was it not i yes that they might not suspect you and perhaps that they might suspect us but it was useless obadiah trome althea knollis's children have been long suffering but the limit of their forbearance has been reached when you laid your hand upon my lover you roused a spirit in me that nothing but your own destruction can satisfy where is he mr trome and where is silly rufus and all the rest who have vanished between deacon spear's house and the little home of the cripples on the high road they have asked me this question but if any one in lost man's lane can answer it is you persecutor of my mother and traducer of ourselves whom i here denounce in face of these skies where god reigns and this earth where man lives to harry and condemn and then i saw that the instinct of this girl had accomplished what our united acumen and skill had failed to do the old man indeed he seemed an old man now cringed and the wrinkles came out in his face till he was demoniacally ugly you viper he shrieked how dare you accuse me of crime 
you whose mother would have died in jail but for my forbearance have you ever seen me set my foot upon a worm look at my fruit and flowers look at my home without a spot or blemish to mar its neatness and propriety can a man who loves these things stomach the destruction of a man much less of a silly yawping boy lucetta you are mad mad or sane my accusation will have its results mr trome i believe too deeply in your guilt not to make others do so ah said he then you have not done so yet you believe this and that but you have not told any one what your suspicions are no she calmly returned though her face blanched to the colourlessness of wax i have not said what i think of you yet oh the cunning that crept into his face she has not said oh the little lucetta the wise the careful little lucetta but i will she cried meeting his eye with the courage and constancy of a martyr though i bring destruction upon myself i will denounce you and do it before the night has settled down upon us i have a lover to avenge a brother to defend besides the earth should be rid of such a monster as you such a monster as i well my pretty one his voice grown suddenly wheedling his face a study of mingled passions we will see about that come just a step nearer lucetta i want to see if you are really the little girl i used to dandle on my knee they were now near the gateway they had been moving all this time his hand was on the curb of the old well his face so turned that it caught the full glare of the setting sun leaned toward the girl exerting a fascinating influence upon her she took the step he asked and before we could shriek out beware we saw him bend forward with a sudden quick motion and then start upright again while her form which but an instant before had stood there in all its frail and inspired beauty tottered as if the ground were bending under it and in another moment disappeared from our appalled sight swallowed in some dreadful cavern that for an instant yawned in the smoothly cut lawn before us and then vanished again from sight as if it had never been a shriek from my whistle mingled with a simultaneous cry of agony from loreen we heard mr gryce rush from behind us but we ourselves found it impossible to stir paralyzed as we were by the sight of the old man's demoniacal delight he was leaping to and fro over the turf holding up his fingers in the red sunset glare six he shrieked six and room for two more oh it's a merry life i lead flowers and fruit and love-making oh how i cringed at that and now and then a little spice like this but where is my pretty lucetta surely she was here a moment ago how could she have vanished then so quickly i do not see her form amid the trees there is no trace of her presence upon the lawn and if they search the house from top to bottom and from bottom to top they will find nothing of her no not so much as a print of her footstep or the scent of the violets she so often wears tucked into her hair these last words uttered in a different voice from the rest gave the clue to the whole situation we saw even while we all bounded forward to the rescue of the devoted maiden that he was one of those maniacs who have perfect control over themselves and pass for very decent sort of men except in the moment of triumph and noting his look of sinister delight perceived that half his pleasure 
and almost his sole reward for the horrible crimes he had perpetrated was in the mystery surrounding his victims and the entire immunity from suspicion which up to this time he had enjoyed meantime mr gryce had covered the wretch with his pistol and his man who succeeded in reaching the place even sooner than ourselves hampered as we were by the almost impenetrable hedge behind which we had crouched tried to lift the grass-covered lid we could faintly discern there but this was impossible until i with almost superhuman self-possession considering the imperative nature of the emergency found the spring hidden in the well curb which worked the deadly mechanism a yell from the writhing creature cowering under the detective's pistol guided me unconsciously in its action and in another moment we saw the fatal lid tip and disclose what appeared to be the remains of a second well long ago dried up and abandoned for the other the rescue of lucetta followed as she had fainted in falling she had not suffered much and soon we had the supreme delight of seeing her eyes unclose ah she murmured in a voice whose echo pierced to every heart save that of the guilty wretch now lying handcuffed on the sward i thought i saw albert he was not dead and i but here mr gryce with an air at once contrite and yet strangely triumphant interposed his benevolent face between hers and her weeping sisters and whispered something in her ear which turned her pallid cheek to a glowing scarlet rising up she threw her arms around his neck and let him lift her as he carried her where was his rheumatism now out of those baleful grounds and away from the reach of the maniac's mingled laughs and cries her face was peace itself but his well his was a study end of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Explanations The hour we all spent together late that night in the old house was unlike any hour which that place had seen for years. Mr. Ostrander, Lucetta, Laureen, William, Mr. Grice and myself all were there and as an especial grace Saracen was allowed to enter that there might not be a cloud upon a single face there assembled though it is a small matter i will add that this dog persisted in lying down by my side not yielding even to the wiles of his master whose amusement over this fact kept him good-natured to the last adieu there were too few candles in the house to make it bright but lucetta's unearthly beauty the peace in laurine's soft eyes made us forget the sombreness of our surroundings and the meagreness of the entertainment hannah attempted to offer us it was the promise of coming joy and when our two guests departed i bade good-night to the girls in their grim upper hall it was with feelings which found their best expression in the two letters i hastened to write as soon as i gained the refuge of my own apartment i will admit you sufficiently into my confidence to let you read those letters the first of them ran thus dear olive to make others happy is the best way to forget our own misfortunes a sudden wedding is to take place in this house order at once for me from the shops you know me to be in the habit of patronizing a wedding gown of dainty white taffeta i did this not to recall too painfully to herself the wedding dress i helped her buy and which was as you may remember of creamy satin with chiffon trimmings and a wedding veil of tulle 
add to this a dress suitable for ocean travel and a half dozen costumes adapted to a southern climate let everything be suitable for a delicate but spirited girl who has seen trouble but who is going to be happy now if a little attention and money can make her so do not spare expense yet show no extravagance for she is a shy bird easily frightened the measurements you will find enclosed also those of another young lady her sister who must also be supplied with a white dress the material of which however had better be of crepe all these things must be here by wednesday evening my own best dress included on saturday evening you may look for my return i shall bring the latter young lady with me so your present loneliness will be forgotten in the pleasure of entertaining an agreeable guest faithfully yours amelia butterworth the second letter was a longer and more important one it was directed to the president of the company which had proposed to send mr ostrander to south america in it i related enough of the circumstances which had kept mr ostrander in x to interest him in the young couple personally and then i told him that if he would forgive mr ostrander this delay and allow him to sail with his young bride by the next steamer i myself would undertake to advance whatever sums might have been lost by this change of arrangement i did not know then that mr gryce had already made this matter good with this same gentleman the next morning we all took a walk in the lane i say nothing about the night if i did not choose to sleep or if i had any cause not to feel quite as elevated in spirit as the young people about me there is surely no reason why i should dwell upon it with you or even apologize for a weakness which you will regard i hope as an exception setting off my customary strength now a walk in this lane was an event to feel at liberty to stroll among its shadows without fear to know that the danger had been so located that we all felt free to inhale the autumn air and to enjoy the beauties of the place without a thought of peril lurking in its sweetest nooks and most attractive coverts gave to this short half-hour a distinctive delight aptly expressed by Lorene when she said i never knew the place was so beautiful why i think i can be happy here now at which lucetta grew pensive till i roused her by saying so much for a constitutional girls now we must to work this house as you see it now has to be prepared for a wedding william your business will be to see that these grounds are put in as good order as possible in the short time allotted to you i will bear the expense and lorene but william had a word to say for himself miss butterworth said he you're a right good sort of woman as saracen has found out and we too in these last few plaguey days but i'm not such a bad lot either and if i do like my own way which may not be other people's way and if i am sometimes short with the girls for some of their damned nonsense i have a little decency about me too and i promise to fix these grounds and out of my own money too now that nine-tenths of our income does not have to go abroad we'll have chink enough to let us live in a respectable manner once more in a place where one horse if he's good enough will give a fellow a standing and make him the envy of those who for some other pesky reasons may think themselves called upon to fight shy of him i don't begrudge the old place a few dollars especially as i mean to live and die in it so look out you three women folks and work as lively as you can on the inside of the old rookery or the slickness of the outside will put you to open shame and that would never please Lorene, nor as i take it miss butterworth either it was a challenge we were glad to accept especially as from the number of persons we now saw come flocking into the lane 
it was very apparent that we should experience no further difficulty in obtaining any help we might need to carry out our undertakings meantime my thoughts were not altogether concentrated upon these pleasing plans for lucetta's benefit there were certain points yet to be made clear in the matter just terminated and there was a confession for me to make without which i could not face mr gryce with all that unwavering composure which our peculiar relations seemed to demand the explanations came first they were volunteered by mr gryce whom i met in the course of the morning at mother jane's cottage that old crone had been perfectly happy all night sleeping with the coin in her hand and waking to again devour it with her greedy but loving eyes as i was alternately watching her and mr gryce who was directing with his hand the movements of the men who had come to smooth down her garden and make it presentable again the detective spoke i suppose you have found it difficult in the light of these new discoveries to explain to yourself how mother jane happened to have those trinkets from the peddler's pack and also how the ring which you very naturally thought must have been entrusted to the dove by mr chittenden himself came to be about its neck when it flew home that day of mr chittenden's disappearance madam we think old mother jane must have helped herself out of the peddler's pack before it was found in the woods there back of her hut and of the other matter our explanation is this one day a young man equipped for travelling paused for a glass of water at the famous well in mr trome's garden just as mother jane's pigeons were picking up the corn scattered for them by the former whose tastes are not confined to the cultivation of fruits and flowers but extend to dumb animals to whom he is uniformly kind the young man wore a ring and being nervous was fiddling with it as he talked to the pleasant old gentleman who was lowering the bucket for him as he fiddled with it the earth fell from under him and as the daylight vanished above his head the ring flew from his upthrown hand and lay the only token of his now blotted out existence upon the emerald sward he had but a moment before pressed with his unsuspicious feet it burned this ruby burned like a drop of blood in the grass when that demon came again to his senses and being a tell-tale evidence of crime in the eyes of one who had allowed nothing to ever speak against him in these matters he stared at it as at a deadly thing directed against himself and to be got rid of at once and by means which by no possibility could recoil back upon himself as its author the pigeons stalking near offered to his abnormally acute understanding the only solution which would leave him absolutely devoid of fear he might have swung open the lid of the well once more and flung it after its owner but this meant an aftermath of experience from which he shrank his delight being in the thought that the victims he saw vanish before his eyes were so many encumbrances wiped off the face of the earth by a sweep of the hand to see or hear them again would be destructive of this notion he preferred the subtler way and to take advantage of old mother jane's characteristics so he caught one of the pigeons he has always been able to lure birds into his hands and tying the ring around the neck of the bird with a blade of grass plucked up from the highway he let it fly and so was rid of the bauble which to mother jane's eyes of course was a direct gift from the heavens through which the bird had flown before lighting on her doorstep wonderful i exclaimed almost overwhelmed with humiliation but preserving a brave front what invention and what audacity the invention and the audacity of a man totally irresponsible for his deeds was it not i asked there is no doubt is there about his being an absolute maniac no madam 
what a relief i felt at that word since we entrapped him yesterday and he found himself fully discovered he has lost all grip upon himself and fills the room we put him in with the unmistakable ravings of a madman it was through these i learned the facts i have just mentioned i drew a deep breath we were standing in the sight of several men and their presence there seemed intolerable unconsciously i began to walk away unconsciously mr gryce followed me at the end of several paces we both stopped we were no longer visible to the crowd and i felt i could speak the words i had been burning to say ever since i saw the true nature of mr trome's character exposed mr gryce said i flushing scarlet which i here solemnly declare is something which has not happened to me before in years and if i can help it shall never happen to me again i am interested in what you say because yesterday at his own gateway mr trome proposed to me and you did not accept him no what do you think i am made of mr gryce i did not accept him but i made the refusal a gentle one and this is not easy work mr gryce i interrupted myself to say with suitable grimness the same thing took place between me and deacon spear and to him i gave a response such as i thought his presumption warranted the discrimination does not argue well for my astuteness mr gryce you see i crave no credit that i do not deserve perhaps you cannot understand that but it is a part of my nature madam said he and i must own i thought his conduct perfect had i not been as completely deceived as yourself i might find words of criticism for this possibly unprofessional partiality but when an old hand like myself can listen to the insinuations of a maniac and repose as i must say i did repose more or less confidence in the statements he chose to make me and which were true enough as to the facts he mentioned but wickedly false and preposterously wrong in suggestion i can have no words of blame for a woman who whatever her understanding and whatever her experience necessarily has seen less of human nature and its incalculable surprises as to the more delicate matter you have been good enough to confide to me madam i have but one remark to make with such an example of womanhood suddenly brought to their notice in such a wild as this how could you expect them sane or insane to do otherwise than they did i know many a worthy man who would like to follow their example and with a bow that left me speechless mr gryce laid his hand on his heart and softly withdrew end of chapter forty Epilogue of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some stray leaflets from an old diary of Althea Knollys, found by me in the packet left in my charge by her daughter Lucetta. I never thought I should do so foolish a thing as begin a diary. When in my boarding school days, which I am very glad to be rid of. I used to see Mealy Butterworth sit down every night of her life over a little book which she called the repository of her daily actions. I thought that if ever I reached that point of imbecility, I would deserve to have fewer lovers and more sense, just as she so frequently advised me to. And yet here I am, pencil in hand, jotting down the nothings of the moment, and with every prospect of continuing to do so for two weeks at least. For, why was I born such a chatterbox, 
i have seen my fate and must talk to some one about him if only to myself nature never having meant me to keep silence on any living topic that interests me yes with lovers in boston lovers in new york and a most determined suitor on the other side of our own home walls in peekskill i have fallen victim to the grave face and methodical ways of a person i need not name since he is the only gentleman in this whole town except but i won't except anybody charles knollys has no peer here or anywhere and this i am ready to declare after only one sight of his face and one look from his eye though to no one but you my secret non-committal confidant for to acknowledge to any human being that my admiration could be caught or my heart touched by a person who had not sued two years at my feet would be to abdicate an ascendancy i am so accustomed to i could not see it vanish without pain besides who knows how i shall feel to-morrow mealy butterworth never shows any hesitation in uttering her opinion either of men or things but then her opinion never changes whilst mine is a very thistle-down blowing hither and thither till i cannot follow its wanderings myself it is one of my charms certain fools say but that is nonsense if my cheeks lacked colour and my eyes were without sparkle or even if i were two inches taller instead of being the tiniest bit of mortal flesh to be found amongst all the young ladies of my age in our so-called society i doubt if the lightness of my mind would meet with the approbation of even the warmest woman lovers of this time as it is it just passes and sometimes as to-night for instance when i can hardly see to inscribe these lines on this page for the vision of two grave if not quietly reproving eyes which float between it and me i almost wish i had some of mealy's responsible characteristics instead of being the airiest merriest and most volatile being that ever tried to laugh down the grandeur of this dreary old house with its century of memories ah that allusion has given me something to say this house what is there about it except its size to make a stranger like me look back continually over her shoulder in going down the long halls or even when nestling comfortably by the great wood fire in the immense drawing-room i am not one of your fanciful ones but i can no more help doing this than i can help wishing judge knollys lived in a less roomy mansion with fewer echoing corners in its innumerable passages i like brightness and cheer at least in my surroundings if i must have gloom or a seriousness which some would call gloom let me have it in individuals where there is some prospect of a blithe careless-hearted little midget effecting a change and not in great towering walls and endless floors which no amount of sunshine or laughter could ever render homelike or even comfortable but there if one has the man one must have the home so i had better say no more against the home till i am quite sure i do not want the man for well well i am not a fool but i did hear something just then a something which makes me tremble yet though i have spent five good minutes trilling the gayest songs i know i think it is very inconsiderate of the witches to bother thus a harmless mite like myself who only asks for love light and money enough to buy a ribbon or a jewel when the fancy takes her which is not as often as my enemies declare and now a question why are my enemies always to be found among the girls and among the plainest of them too i never heard a man say anything against me though i have sometimes surprised a look on their faces i saw it to-day 
which might signify reproof if it were not accompanied by a smile showing anything but displeasure but this is a digression as mealy would say what i want to do but which i seem to find it very difficult to do is to tell how i came to be here and what i have seen since i came first then to be very short about the matter i am here because the old folks that is my father and mr knollys have decided charles and i should know each other in thought i curtsy to the decision i think we ought to too for while many other men are handsomer or better known or have more money alas than he he alone has a way of drawing up to one side with an air that captivates the eye and sets the heart trembling a heart moreover that never knew before it could tremble except in the presence of great worldly prosperity and beautiful beautiful things so as this experience is new i am dutifully obliged for the excitement it gives me and am glad to be here awesome as the place is and destitute of any such pleasures as i have been accustomed to in the gay cities where i have hitherto spent most of my time but there i am rambling again i have come to x as you now see for good and sufficient reasons and while this house is one of consequence and has been the resort of many notable people it is a little lonesome our only neighbour being a young man who has a fine enough appearance but who has already shown his admiration of me so plainly of course he was in the road when i drove up to the house that i lost all interest in him at once such a nonsensical liking at first sight being as i take it a tribute only to my audacious little travelling bonnet and the curl or two which will fall out on my cheek when i move my head about too quickly as i certainly could not be blamed for doing in driving into a place where i was expected to make myself happy for two weeks he then is out of these chronicles when i say his name is obadiah trome you will probably be duly thankful but he is not as stiff and biblical as his name would lead you to expect on the contrary he is lithe graceful and suave to a point which makes charles knollys's judicial face a positive relief to the eye and such little understanding as has been accorded me i cannot write another word it is twelve o'clock and though i have the cosiest room in the house all chintz and decorated china i find myself listening and peering just as i did downstairs in their great barn of a drawing-room i wonder if any very dreadful things ever happened in this house i will ask old mr knollys to-morrow or or mr charles i am sorry i was so inquisitive for the stories charles told me i thought i had better not trouble the old gentleman have only served to people the shadows of this rambling old house with figures of whose acquaintance i am likely to be more or less shy one tale in particular gave me the shivers it was about a mother and daughter who both loved the same man it seems incredible girls so seldom seeing with the eyes of their mothers and it was the daughter who married him while the mother broken-hearted fled from the wedding and was driven up to the great door here in a coach dead they say that the coach still travels the road just before some calamity to the family a phantom coach which floats along in shadow turning the air about it to mist that chills the marrow in the bones of the unfortunate who sees it i am going to see it myself some day the real coach i mean in which this tragic event took place it is still in the stable charles tells me i wonder if i will have the courage to sit where that poor devoted mother breathed out her miserable existence i shall endeavour to do so 
if only to defy the fate which seems to be closing in upon me charles is an able lawyer but his argument in favour of close bonnets versus bewitching little pokes with a rose or two in front was very weak i thought to-day he seemed to think so himself after a while for when as the only means of convincing him of the weakness of the cause he was advocating i ran upstairs and put on a poke similar to the aforesaid he retracted at once and let the case go by default for which i and the poke made suitable acknowledgments to the great amusement of papa knollys who was on my side from the first not much going on to-day yet i have never felt merrier oh ye hideous bare old walls won't i make you ring if i won't have it i won't have that smooth persistent hypocrite pushing his way into my presence when my whole heart and attention belong to a man who would love me if he only could get his own leave to do so obadiah trome has been here to-day on one pretext or another three times once he came to bring some very choice apples as if i cared for apples the second time he had a question of great importance no doubt to put to charles and as charles was in my company the whole interview lasted let us say a good half hour at least the third time he came it was to see me which as it was now evening meant talk 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 in the great drawing-room with just a song interpolated now and then instead of a cosy chat in the window-seat of the pretty flower-parlour with only one pair of ears to please and one pair of eyes to watch master trome was intrusive and if no one felt it but myself it is because charles knollys has set himself up an ideal of womanhood to which i am a contradiction but that will not affect the end a woman may be such a contradiction and yet win if her heart is in the struggle and she has besides a certain individuality of her own which appeals to the eye and heart if not to the understanding i do not despair of seeing charles knollys's forehead taking a very deep frown at sight of his handsome and most attentive neighbour hey ho why don't i answer mealy butterworth's last letter am i ashamed to tell her that i have to limit my effusion to just four pages because i have commenced a diary i declare i begin to regard it a misfortune to have dimples i never have regarded it so before when i have seen man after man succumb to them but now they have become my bane for they attract two admirers just at the time they should attract but one and it is upon the wrong man they flash the oftenest why i leave it to all true lovers to explain as a consequence master trome is beginning to assume an air of superiority and charles who may not believe in dimples but who on that very account perhaps seems to be always on the lookout for them shrinks more or less into the background as is not becoming in a man with so many claims to respect if not to love i want to feel that each one of these precious fourteen days contains all that it can of delight and satisfaction and how can i when obadiah oh the charming and romantic name holds my cruels instead of charles and whispers words which coming from other lips would do more than waken my dimples but if i must have a suitor just when a suitor is not wanted let me at least make him useful charles shall read his own heart in this man's passion i don't know why but i have taken a dislike to the flower parlour it now vies with the great drawing-room in my disregard yesterday in crossing it i felt a chill so sudden and so penetrating 
that i irresistibly thought of the old saying someone is walking over my grave my grave where lies it and why should i feel the shudder of it now am i destined to an early death the bounding life in my veins says no but i never again shall like that room it has made me think i have not only sat in the old coach but i had let me drop the words slowly they are so precious i i have had a kiss given me there charles gave me this kiss he could not help it i was sitting on the seat in front in a sort of mock mirth he was endeavouring to frown upon when suddenly i glanced up and our eyes met and he says it was the sauciness of my dimples oh those old dimples they seem to have stood me in good stead after all but i say it was my sincere affection which drew him for he stooped like a man forgetful of everything in the whole wide world but the little trembling panting being before him and gave me one of those caresses which seals a woman's fate for ever and made me the feather-brained and thoughtless coquette a slave to this large-minded and true-hearted man for all my life hereafter why i should be so happy over this event is beyond my understanding that he should be in the seventh heaven of delight is only to be expected but that i should find myself tripping through this gloomy old house like one treading on air is a mystery to the elucidation of which i can only give my dimples my reason can make nothing out of it i who thought of nothing short of a grand establishment in boston money servants and a husband who would love me blindly whatever my faults have given my troth you will say my lips but the one means the other to a man who will never be known outside of his own county never be rich never be blind even for he frowns upon me as often as he smiles and worst of all who lives in a house so vast and so full of tragic suggestion that it might well awaken doleful anticipations in much more serious-minded persons than myself and yet i am happy so happy that i have even attempted to make the acquaintance of the grim old portraits and weak pastels which line the walls of many of these bedrooms old mr knollys caught me curtsying just now before one of these ancestral beauties whose face seemed to hold a faint prophecy of my own and perceiving by my blushes that this was something more than a mere childish freak on my part he chucked me under the chin and laughingly asked how long it was likely to be before he might have the honour of adding my pretty face to the collection which should have made me indignant only i am not in an indignant mood just now why have i been so foolish why did i not let my over-fond neighbour know from the beginning that i detested him instead of but what have i done anyway a smile a nod a laughing word mean nothing when one has eyes which persist in dancing in spite of one's every effort to keep them demure men who become fools are apt to call one a coquette when a little good sense would teach them that the woman who smiles always has some other way of showing her regard to the man she really favours i could not help being on merry terms with mr trome if only to hide the effect another's presence has on me but he thinks otherwise and to-day i had ample reason for seeing why his good looks and easy manners have invariably awakened distrust in me rather than admiration master trome is vindictive and i should be afraid of him if i had not observed in him the presence of another passion which will soon engross all his attention and make him forget me 
as soon as ever I become Charles's wife. Money is his idol, and as fortune seems to favour him, he will soon be happy in the mere pleasure of accumulation. But this is not relating what happened today. We were walking in the shrubbery. By we, I naturally mean Charles and myself, and he was saying things which made me at the same time happy and a bit serious when I suddenly felt myself under the spell of some baleful influence that filled me with a dismay I could neither understand nor escape from. As this could not proceed from Charles, I turned to look about me when I encountered the eyes of Obadiah Trome, who was leaning on the fence separating his grounds from those of Mr. Knollys, looking directly at us. If I flinched at this surveillance, it was but the natural expression of my indignation. His face wore a look calculated to frighten any one, and though he did not respond to the gesture I made him, I felt that my only chance of escaping a scene was to induce Charles to leave me before he should see what I saw in the lowering countenance of his intrusive neighbour. As the situation demanded self-possession and the exercise of a ready wit, and as these are qualities in which I am not altogether deficient, I succeeded in carrying out my intention sooner even than I expected. Charles hurried from my presence at the first word, and proceeded towards the house without seeing Trome, and I, quivering with dread, turned towards the man whom I felt rather than saw approaching me. He met me with a look I shall never forget. I have had lovers, too many of them, and this is not the first man I have been compelled to meet with rebuff and disdain, but never in the whole course of my none too extended existence have I been confronted by such passion, or overwhelmed with such bitter recrimination. He seemed like a man beside himself, yet he was quiet too quiet, and while his voice did not rise above a whisper, and he approached no nearer than the demands of courtesy required, he produced so terrifying an effect upon me that I longed to cry for help, and would have done so, but that my throat closed with fright, and I could only gurgle forth a remonstrance too faint even for him to hear. You have played with a man's best feelings, he said. You have led me to believe that I had only to speak to have you for my own. Are you simply foolish, or are you wicked? Did you care for me at all, or was it only your wish to increase the number of men in your train? This one, here his hand pointed quiveringly towards the house, has enjoyed a happiness denied me. His hand has touched yours, his lips, here his words became almost unintelligible, till his purpose gave him strength, and he cried, But notwithstanding this, notwithstanding any vows you may have exchanged, I have claims upon you that I will not yield. I, who have loved no woman before you, will have such a hand in your fate that you will never be able to separate yourself from the influence I shall exert over you. I will not intrude between you and your lover. I will not affect dislike or disturb your outer life with any vain display of my hatred or my passion. But I will work upon your secret thoughts and create a slowly increasing dread in the inner sanctuary of your heart till you wish you had called up the deadliest of serpents in your pathway, rather than the latent fury of Obadiah Trome. You are a girl now. When you are married and become a mother, you will understand me. For the present, I leave you. The shadow of this old house, which has never seen much happiness within it, will soon rest upon your thoughtless head. What that will not do, your own inherent weakness will. 
the woman who trifles with a strong man's heart has a flaw in her nature which will work out her own destruction in time i can afford to let you enjoy your prospective honeymoon in peace afterwards he cast a threatening look towards the decaying structure behind me and was silent but that silence did not unloose my tongue i was absolutely speechless ten brides have crossed yonder threshold he presently went on in a low musing tone freighted with horrible fatality one and she was the girl whose mother was driven up to these doors dead lived to take her grandchildren on her knees the rest died early and most of them unhappily oh i have studied the traditions of your future home you will live but of all the brides who have triumphed in the honourable name of knollys you will lead the saddest life and meet the gloomiest end notwithstanding you stand before me now with loose locks flying in the wind and a heart so gay that even my despair can barely pale the roses on your cheek this was the raving of a madman i recognised it as such and took a little heart how could he see into my future how could he prophesy evil to one over whom he will have no control to one watched over and beloved by a man like charles he is a dreamer a fanatic his talk about the flaw in my nature is nonsense and as for the fate lowering over my head in the shadows falling from the toppling old house in which i am likely to take up my abode that is only frenzy and i would be unworthy of happiness to heed it as i realised this my indignation grew and uttering a few contemptuous words i was hurrying away when he stopped me with a final warning wait he said women like you cannot keep either their joys or their miseries to themselves but i advise you not to take charles knollys into your confidence if you do a duel will follow and if i have not the legal acumen of your intended i have an eye and a hand before which he must fall if our passions come to an issue so beware never while you live betray what has passed between us at this interview unless the weariness of a misplaced affection should come to you and with it the desire to be rid of your husband a frightful threat which unfortunately perhaps has sealed my lips oh why should such monsters live I have been all through the house today with old Mr. Knollys. Every room was opened for my inspection, and I was bidden to choose which should be refurnished for my benefit. It was a gruesome trip, from which I have returned to my own little nook of chintz as to a refuge. Great rooms, which for years have been the abode of spiders, are not much to my liking but i chose out two which at least have fireplaces in them and these are to be made as cheerful as circumstances will permit i hope when i again see them it will not be by the light of a waning november afternoon when the few leaves still left to flutter from the trees blow soggy and wet against the panes of the solitary windows or lie in sodden masses at the foot of the bare trunks which cluster so thickly on the lawn as to hide all view of the high road i was meant for laughter and joy flashing lights and the splendours of ballrooms why have i chosen then to give up the great world and settle down in this grimmest of grim old houses in a none too lively village i think it is because i love charles knollys and so no matter how my heart sinks in the dim shadows that haunt every spot i stray into i will be merry will think of charles instead of myself 
and so live down the unhappy prophecies uttered by the wretch who with his venomous words has robbed the future of whatever charm my love was likely to cast upon it the fact that this man left the town to-day for a lengthy trip abroad should raise my spirits more than it has if we were going now charles and i but why dream of a paradise whose doors remain closed to you it is here our honeymoon is destined to be passed within these walls and in sight of the bare boughs rattling at this moment against the panes i made a misstatement when i said that i had gone into all the rooms of the house this afternoon i did not enter the flower parlour i had been married a month and had as i thought no further use for this foolish diary so one evening when charles was away i attempted to burn it but when i had flung myself down before the blazing logs of my bedroom fire i was then young enough to love to crouch for hours on the rug in my lonely room seeking for all i delighted in and longed for in the glowing embers some instinct or was it a premonition made me withhold from destruction a record which coming events might make worthy of preservation that was five years ago and to-day i have reopened the secret drawer in which this simple book has so long lain undisturbed and am once more penning lines destined perhaps to pass into oblivion together with the others why i do not know there is no change in my married life i have no trouble no anxiety no reason for dread yet well well some women are made for the simple round of domestic duties and others are as out of place in the nursery and kitchen as butterflies in a granary i want just the things charles cannot give me i have home love children all that some women most crave and while i idolize my husband and know of nothing sweeter than my babies i yet have spells of such wretched weariness that it would be a relief to me to be a little less comfortable if only i might enjoy a more brilliant existence but charles is not rich sometimes i think he is poor and however much i may desire change i cannot have it hey ho and what is worse i haven't had a new dress in a year i who so love dress and become it so well why if it is my lot to go shabby and tie up my dancing ringlets with faded ribbons was i made with the figure of a fairy and given a temperament which without any effort on my part makes me diminutive as i am the centre of every group i enter if i were plain or shy or even self-contained i might be happy here but now there there i will go kiss little william and lay Lorene's baby arm about my neck and see if the wicked demons will fly away charles is too busy for me to intrude upon him in that horrid flower parlour i was never superstitious till i entered this house but now i believe in every sort of thing a sane woman should not yesterday after a neglect of five years i brought out my diary to-day i have to record in it that there was a reason for my doing so obadiah trome has returned home i saw him this morning leaning over his fence in the same place and in very much the same attitude as on that day when he frightened me so a month before my wedding but he did not frighten me to-day he merely looked at me very sharply and with a less offensive admiration than in the early days of our first acquaintance at which i made him my best curtsey i was not going to remind him of the past in our new relations and he thankful perhaps for this took off his hat with a smile i am trying even yet to explain to myself 
then we began to talk he had travelled everywhere and i had been nowhere he wore the dress and displayed the manners of the great world while i had only a hungry desire to do the same as for fashion i needed all my beauty and the fading sparkle of my old animation to enable me to hold up my head before him but as for liking him i did not i could admire his appearance but he himself attracted me no more than when he had words of angry fury on his tongue he is a gentleman and one who has seen the world but in other ways he is no more to be compared with my charles than his pert new house built in his absence with the grand old structure with whose fatality he once threatened me i do not think he wants to threaten me with disaster now time closes such wounds as his very effectually i wish we had some of his money i have always heard that the wives of the nullis whatever their misfortune have always loved their husbands i do not think i am any exception to the rule when charles has leisure to give me an hour from his musty old books the place here seems lively enough and the children's voices do not sound so shrill but these hours are so infrequent if it were not for mr trome's journal did i mention that he had lent me a journal of his travels i should often eat my heart out with loneliness i am beginning to like the man better as i follow him from city to city of the old world if he had ever mentioned me in its pages i would not read another line in it but he seems to have expended both his love and spite when he bade me farewell in the garden underlying these bleak old walls i am becoming as well acquainted with mr trome's handwriting as with my own i read and read and read in his journal and only stop when the dreaded midnight hour comes with its ghostly suggestions and the unaccountable noises which make this old dwelling so uncanny charles often finds me curled up over this book and when he does he sighs why i have been teaching Lorene to dance oh how merry it has made me i think i will be happier now we have the large upper hall to take steps in and when she makes a misstep we laugh and that is a good sound to hear in this old place if i could only have a little money to buy her a fresh frock and some ribbons i would feel perfectly satisfied but i do believe charles is getting poorer and poorer every day the place costs so much to keep up he says and when his father died there were debts to be paid which leaves us his innocent inheritors very straitened master trome has no such difficulties he has money enough but i don't like the man for all that polite as he is to us all he seems to quite adore loreen and as to william he pets him till i feel almost uncomfortable at times what shall i do i am invited to new york i and charles says i may go too only i have nothing to wear oh for some money a little money it is my right to have some money but charles tells me he can only spare enough to pay my expenses that my sunday frock looks very well and that even if it did not i am pretty enough to do without fine clothes and other nonsense like that sweet enough but totally without point in fact if i am pretty all the more i need a little finery to set me off and besides to go to new york without money why i should be perfectly miserable charles himself ought to realize this and be willing to sell his old books before he would let me go into this whirl of temptation without a dollar to spend as he don't i must devise some plan of my own for obtaining a little money for i won't give up my trip the first offered me since i was married and neither will i go away and come back without a gift for my two girls who have grown to womanhood without a jewel to adorn them 
or a silk dress to make them look like gentlemen's children. But how get money without Charles knowing it? Mr. Trome is such a good friend. He might lend me a little, but I don't know how to ask him without recalling to his mind certain words long since forgotten by him, perhaps, but never to be forgotten by me, feather-brained as many people think me. Is there anyone else? I wonder if some things are as wicked as people say they are. I... Here the diary breaks off abruptly, but we know what followed. The forgery, the discovery of it by her suave but secret enemy, his unnatural revenge, and the never-dying enmity which led to the tragic events it has been my unhappy fortune to relate at such length. Poor Althea! With thy name I write Finis to these pages. May the dust lie lightly on thy breast under the shadow of the flower parlour, through which thy footsteps passed with such dread in the old days of thy youthful beauty and innocence. End of the Epilogue Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England End of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green